Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast. I'm your host, Rafe Kelly. At Evolve Move Play, our aim is to help you cultivate a more meaningful life and a more heroic self by reconnecting deeply to movement, mindfulness, nature, and community practices. This podcast was created to bring the best and brightest minds in all of these subjects together to better understand how we can create an empowering and sustainable ecology of practices for personal growth. If you're interested in being part of this ongoing conversation, the best way you can support us and get involved is by joining our Podcast Plus membership. By joining, you will get backstage access to our live podcast airing once a month, as well as a private question and answer session with me and our guests after the show. On top of that, you'll get access to our thriving online community where you can continue these deeper discussions with people all over the world who are just as passionate and curious about these topics as you. More details about the membership as well as the link to get signed up are in the description below. And whether you can join, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so that you can be notified every Monday when our episodes drop. Thanks so much for your support and we hope you enjoy the show. Hey guys, welcome back to the Evolve Move Play podcast. This week, my guest is once again, Jonathan Pajot. So this is my second conversation with Jonathan. We first recorded our conversation back in May. And when we released it, the response was really tremendous. I think it's the most popular uh, podcast on my channel. Uh, it was really well received on his channel as well. Um, and a lot of people felt that it it did something important in forwarding the conversation of how we how we connect a kind of symbolic and meaning uh, focused worldview with a rational materialist and scientific worldview. So I was a little bit taken aback actually by how much positive response it got. And I had been following Jonathan's stuff for years. I'd met him um, at a Jordan Peterson event, but it took me a long time to start to grok what he was really talking about and where he was coming from. And so I knew I wanted to talk to him for a long time, but I didn't know exactly what needed to happen in that conversation. So I didn't know how to start it. But then I saw him on a in a conversation with Rationality Rules and Adam Friended. And I thought that both of them had mistakenly assumed that Jonathan was fundamentally operating within the same type of rational materialist epistemology that they were. And I thought that I could represent that worldview, the rational materialist worldview. Um, better, honestly, than it had been, while also more deeply respecting the epistemology within which um, Peugeot was operating in order to try to find a bridge between the two. And I thought that we made really great progress in that first conversation. Um, But we did reach a point where it felt like there was an incongruence in our worldview that was almost unspannable. This happened around the idea of the face in the clouds. So as I approached this next conversation, I, I was intimidated to try to take the, the conversation further. Um, being really honest, there's times in these conversations that I just don't know that I'm the guy, <laughs> uh, that, I, that I have the tool set to, to do what I'm trying to do. Um, and I was actually really, really pleased how far this conversation went and how much more of a bridge I felt like we produced. Um, I don't think we solved the problem, and I don't think that uh, any two thinkers really are necessarily capable of solving the problem. But I do think that we forwarded the conversation in a really profound way, and that felt really satisfying to me. Uh, So this is two and a half hours, um, and it's actually almost two different conversations. The first hour and a half is a conversation really where we're applying the symbolic worldview, where I'm, I'm asking for some of his insights, and I'm sharing some of the insights that I've had through applying some of the symbolic worldview to to the stories that I'm paying attention to and what's happening in our culture around storytelling. And that's a super interesting conversation for me. Um, And I think many of you guys will also find it really, really fascinating. And the second half of the conversation starting around uh, an hour and 30 minutes in is really the conversation about how we bridge these two epistemologies. And we start where we left off with the question of, is a face in a cloud a face in a real way? And what do we mean by real? Um, and I think we do some really good work in, in hacking at that question and in grounding what the discussion is and, and where the disagreements are. So I was really pleased with this. Um, I think you guys will be as well. Uh, for all of you who've watched this before, uh, the previous one, I think you know, you're gonna really enjoy this one. If you 
haven't seen the previous one, I highly recommend going ahead and, and, and watching that first. I don't think that this is the place to start. I think you need to start in the first conversation. But um, I think there's a ton of, of valuable insight generation in this conversation. I'm really pleased to be able to bring it to you guys. I'm really pleased to be in dialogue with Jonathan. Um, so without further ado, here's my conversation with Jonathan Peugeot. It's Jonathan, like I just said, it's great to, to be able to have a conversation with you again. I was, uh, yeah, I was really pleased with how the first one went and I was really amazed by the response. It seemed like a lot of people uh, appreciated the, the meeting of the two worldviews and how we conducted that. Yeah, I felt that too. I felt a lot of people, I think a lot of people felt like it was a good bridge. Like it really, it was a good way to kind of bridge two worlds. And so, so yeah, I think it's great. Looking forward to, to continuing our conversation. Yeah. Before we get started, I just wanted to ask you this, just totally random, but how's your, uh, your, your kids doing uh, Ninja Warrior stuff, right? How, how's that been going? Well, he's not doing anything really, yeah. uh, just because at least for now he's not vaccinated. So uh, yeah, that's it. So, so that right here, I don't know where you are, but here there's a COVID pass for every anything that's public, any after school activity, um, basically, yeah, anything. So, so, so for now, he's not doing anything. So we'll see what happens. Well, I, I hope all that gets sorted out. I I was excited by the idea that you're that you're that that our worlds were connected. Also, yeah, exactly. Well, practice. I mean, they might still be. It just depends how things are gonna are gonna go. So we'll yeah. See. That uh, COVID pass thing is that could be a whole, whole deep, deep, difficult rabbit hole. So let's let's not let's start. Let's there. not go there. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, I was thinking about it. it it's interesting. It's been now, I think six months since we last chatted, and it seemed like there was a lot still to do. But as I look back on that conversation, I felt like we just kind of gotten to the point where it was going to potentially be difficult, and. Uh, and so that's why I, I, you know, I needed to take my time and kind of focus on on some other things before I can come back to this. But I, as I as I was reviewing and listening to a lot of your content, I found there's like it feels like there's almost two conversations, and it felt like our first conversation too was almost two conversations. Part of it is introducing your symbolic worldview and all the insight that I think that it generates to my audience, and just kind of myself just as a curious person who's interested in what your insights, being able to pull some of that. And then the other is getting into this conversation about like, well, how do we create this bridge between the scientific worldview and the symbolic worldview? And I think, I think those two themes are, would be useful to, to explore again. Um, so I kind of wanted to start with the easier part, which is the, um, let's, let's, let's dig deeper into symbolic, just the symbolic basic worldview. symbolic worldview. Um, I don't, does that feel good to you? Yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah, I mean, I any any way you think is best to go at it, I'm fine. I've been thinking a lot about your insights recently in reference to, you talked about this idea that we should be looking for the narrative of the return of the king. And I, I'd be curious to have you describe why that's important and why, why our culture is so sort of... Um, seems so allergic to the very idea of hierarchy and why we might need to have a, a reapproachment with hierarchy as something that's actually positive and that we need to understand on a deeper level. It's a big story. The reason why we are, so we could see it. We can, how can I say this? We, we can see it from inside the story of hierarchy and then we can see it from the other side, right? We can see it from the, the, the people who wanted to eliminate uh, hierarchy and we can see it from inside the story of those that saw a hierarchy as the normal way in which the world kind of lays itself out. What, what happened in the West, let's say, especially, is there was a manifestation of extremes. So what hierarchy does, what hierarchy does, the great thing about hierarchy is that it, it joins different levels of reality together. So you could say it's, it's something like there are invisible things. Right, abstract patterns, rules, laws, uh, but also things that are more akin to what traditional like gods, angels, right? Things that are invisible, right? Principalities that act upon the world, uh, and then there's potential uh, for those to manifest themselves into, right? And so, what hierarchy does is that it does it fractally. It, it makes it possible for these things to kind of manifest themselves at all different levels, and so 
this the that's a the structure of a, of a of a hierarchical society, for example, is something like uh, let's say and imagine it like this: like an emperor with like different principalities, and then the principalities also have different sections of their land, and those sections of land, you know, have little yep. lords, and it just kind of keeps going. And then there's the family where the father is akin to the lord, and then the the, the children are akin to the land, right? So it goes, it starts at the top and it goes all the way down to the bottom. And so that's what that's what a hierarchical society ends up looking like. It's very flexible. It's not like there's only one way to do it. There are many ways to do it, but the basic pattern will kind of look like that. Um, but whereas a our societies, the way we wanted to, to develop them ended up splitting these two sides. So you have on the one hand, something like absolute, power of a of a, an authority and then on the other hand the idea of democracy or freedom or or uh libertarianism like a, a version of that i mean obviously those things didn't have those words at the outset but they kind of lead towards these types of thinking uh and so we're stuck in these opposites so we don't have a way for them to kind of join to for the worlds to kind of join together in this structure we're struck in these opposites and we flip from one to the other and so this is something Plato talked about. Plato talked about this in the in the in the Republic, right? He said that too much freedom calls for too much too much order, right? Too much too much a democracy calls to tyranny. So if you go too far in democracy, at some point the system breaks down, and then the people desire tyranny. So it's not just that we have this story, we have this image in movies where the tyrant comes and takes over, right? But that's not necessarily how it happens. People desire tyranny because mm-hmm. they're tired of things being being falling apart and meaninglessness and everything. And so my, let's say, this is something that is manifested in the modern world where, when it, it can start with the idea of, let's say, total monarchies uh, before the revolution, but then the revolution. And then from the revolution to the tyrannical states, you know, to the, uh, to the um, totalitarian states uh, of communism and of fascism. Et cetera, et cetera. And then the America as this like democracy that just falls apart, becomes decadent, falls apart. And now, right. So now we're on this, we're, we're, we're seeing the change. It's we're in it right now. We're in this change where it's changing from the, the chaotic democracy open to everything. You know, everybody's free to do what they want into a authoritarian system, the likes of which the yeah. humanity has never seen. Basically, so it doesn't mean that doesn't necessarily mean right away that people are going to go to the gulag, but the systems of control that we're seeing being put in place are systems that have never been so strong. And so the, one of the reasons why I want to reintroduce hierarchy into the world, not just socially, these things happen fractally. If you can't think in hierarchies and you don't and you don't see them as existing, even embodied, right, even in, in the way in which you move, the way in which you act, uh, then you're not going to be able to you're not going to be able to conceive of normal hierarchies socially. So it has to happen at every level, and the fact that it doesn't like so let's say the absence of hierarchy in in the world leads to something like leads to something like transhumanism, where you think that there's no connection between the patterns of reality and your bodies. So it's like you pr- so the so this ha- like an, you you project yourself in an avatar. And you have these avatar beings that exist online that are like projections of your psyche into the digital space. These are all fruits of the the incapacity people have to think or to exist in normal hierarchies where things are actually connected together at different levels. So it's hard to give all the examples, but it's, it's important to see that what I'm saying isn't a political statement as such. It's a statement about how we exist in reality. And those have consequences that also aren't just political, that are also social in your own life. A social, I mean, personal, even in your own life. Yeah. Um, what comes up for me is like, you know, as we spoke about in the, in the, uh, the first conversation, I, I grew up in the counterculture, right? I grew up in a element of the culture that had thrown off maybe the excessive shackles of, of a overly tyrannical culture yeah. and had, had taken on this idea of freedom but had ended up with a lot of dysfunction. And I grew up and obviously I, I ended up defaulting in some sense into the, the mainstream culture. 
and I started training parkour, right? We've talked about the, the, the analogy of parkour. One of the really interesting things that happened in the beginning of parkour was that they automatically developed hierarchy. People who were assertive, people who were very skilled, people who had some teaching skill become the leaders of these communities. And you could really see that the whole temperament, the whole character of a community was really deeply related to who the kind of founding leaders of that community were. And leaders that didn't have communities or communities that didn't have leaders just largely didn't happen. And when leaders stepped out of leadership, often there was a vacuum and the community collapsed. And so I got this kind of this uh, really interesting view into it. And it, from my anthropological background, I had you know, learned about the idea of like band level societies where there's no real hierarchy to tribal societies where you have a big man who's largely just pro-social, but doesn't have tons of personal benefit from it to then you have rent seeking chiefdoms, right? And then and then state societies. And and I kind of I kind of saw that in the parkour community. It was like when there were six or seven of us, there was no hierarchy. And then when there were 50, it was like you had to as a leader. There's no way to exist as 50 without like a hierarchy. Yeah. And then when there's 500, it's like the leader has to be paid to be the leader. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and so you kind of had this, this iteration of the structure up. And when I, when I first encountered Peterson, you know, the idea that, that we can't actually even view the world without some sort of hierarchy, we have to be able to select what to pay attention to, which is automatically a value judgment. That was, was profound to me. And, and it was really interesting to me how, when I became the leader of the parkour community, being told the leader of the parkour community that I was that was off-putting, right? It, it, it felt dangerous. It felt, um, it, it conflicted with an ethic that I had kind of been built into of, of distrust of hierarchy, right? That's mm. what a lot of the counterculture is, is just distrust of hierarchy. So that there's, there's something to me, that's an interesting example of like, it's, it's there and we can't get away from it. But also I've been thinking a lot about my, my relationship with the counterculture, because in a lot of ways, what I do is very deeply countercultural, but I also have this real antipathy. I was listening back to our previous conversation and I, I dropped so much cursing when I was referring to the counterculture. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was listening to the story of MK ultra and how, how they experimented on people with, with LSD and how that was happening in the sixties. And I was thinking about how, how broken the hierarchy, the, the system of, of, uh, of the United States was and how the, there was a real reason for the counterculture. Mm. Somehow it wasn't integrated enough to produce something that could sustain itself as a replacement. Yeah, but there's the secret. The, se <laughs> the secret is that they're connected. Mm -hmm. You think there's no connection between MK Ultra and LSD well, counterculture in the 60s? Right? Hyde Ashbury, right? They were... They're running these experiments in the Hyde Ashbury, which is right. the hippie culture. And so there's a, there, th this is the thing about extremes is that we don't realize how connected they are. Uh, and that, yeah. like, you know, it's, it's kind of like the problem of the matrix, right? It's like mm -hmm. the problem of opposing the system, but being in the system. And it's like, it, it's not as easy as you think. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I think there's role for counterculture, but you need to, you need to be able to pull away and to be able to see the role of counterculture within a meta vision of culture. Right. Yeah. So that's why let's say the, the pattern that I rep that I present, like the pattern of reality isn't, isn't a pattern per se in, in the strict sense. It's a pattern moving into nothing, right? It's a pattern and it's breakdown. And yeah. so, so that's the image of the mountain, which goes into the water or goes into the chaos, you know, and so that if we have, so it's almost like a meta pattern where it's like the pattern and the, the things that challenge it. And so if you understand counterculture like that, then it, you can kind of see its role. But if you think of it in an absolute terms, where you actually think that counterculture is really counterculture, mm -hmm. then you're deluding yourself. Like you're, you're joking with yourself. You're, 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 you're being deluded by, by something, you know, there's something you're, like this, this coexistence of the extremes or the paradoxical coexistence of the extremes is something you mentioned earlier. That's really been, when been bothering me or I've been trying to articulate it and think about it because we have this say movement to towards the, uh, 
there's these, these highly anti-hierarchical structures and anti-authoritarian or like everyone should have the freedom to define every aspect of themselves in, in every way, right? But if you question that, there's 100% authority that's going to come down on you. That's right. And so there's this, there's this weird juxtaposition of let's push these very specific aspects of freedom or liberties while allowing the growth of something extraordinarily authoritarian in order to control it. Like as someone who grew up in the counterculture, the relationship of the, of the left activist base that sees itself as the, as the, as the, the rebels, right? They're, they're, (laughs) they're this really funny thing where like the people who exist in the power structure see themselves as the rebellion. That's right. If you understand the history of the 20th century, you also understand why this is the most dangerous situation you can find yourself in. Yeah. The most dangerous situation you can find yourself in is people who think they're victims, but are in power. Mm -hmm. Right. That's where genocide comes from. Genocide always comes from people who think they're victims and are in power at the same time. Like, I'm not saying we're headed towards a genocide, but I'm saying that that is really the way it happened, both in terms of the genocidal action. They're not genocidal, but like the mass murdering actions of the Soviet elites Mm -hmm. and the genocides of the fascist states and the genocides and the genocide in Rwanda and the ethnic cleansing in 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 uh, in the ex Yugoslavia. It's like it's always the same story. The word that comes into my head there is scapegoating, right? That that uh, you know, it's sort of it's a that, different kind of scapegoating. Yeah. It's a it's a it's an antichrist scapegoating is the way to understand it. It's 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 it really is a pattern of antichrist, like technically a pattern of antichrist, because in in traditional societies, like in ancient societies, you would just scapegoat. Mm-hmm. You would just scapegoat. You would just take a stranger. You take a slave. You take a you take uh, someone who is on the margin of your society, you just blame all the problems on them, ritually or, or directly, and then you kill them, or you get rid of them, or you, you, you cast them out, or you mark them as pariah, right? You find these ways of doing it. Now, one of the things that Christianity did is that it included into the system, the hierarchical system, the notion that in order to have a truly balanced hierarchy, the, the top of the hierarchy has to also exist for the bottom of the hierarchy. That is, it's not just a thing moving up. It's yeah. actually a thing which moves up to move back down and fill itself. And so the notion of self-sacrifice became the image of, of Christianity. And so the idea that um, we, we can... The, the top moves towards the victim, right? So you have the, the people on the, on the edge of society that are, let's say, victims of the, of the system that can't totally fit. And there's a way in which that which is above moves out and tries to get the lost sheep, right? Tries to get, you know, tries to put a hand out to the, to the beggar, to the leper, to, the, to heal those things that don't fit into the system, right? So it's like a different vision of hierarchy. But in that is hidden a kind of parasite. And this is the parasite of the value of the victim, you could say. Mm-hmm. And the victim is, does have value. But there's a way in which that can be turned in, in an upside down way where it's like the victim becomes value in itself, right? Where the victim, where the victim has value for being a victim. Victimhood becomes the, victimhood is sacralized. And, and it becomes a way to power in itself. Yes. And especially when it's self appointed. And so, for example, like in Christianity, there is a manner in which, for example, let's say you become a victim. So let's say you, you, you are faced with someone who, who, who hates, who, who hates Christ and kills you for Christ. So you're, you're a martyr for Christ. You die. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, that's, that's actually something which is praised in Christianity, Mm -hmm. but there isn't the sense in which you, self-identify as a victim and then you want to get rid of your oppressor in the name of that victimhood that is not a christian pattern it's like a parasite in the christian system and so it's like it's antichrist 
Yeah. It's the best way to understand it is to understand it as antichrist. It's actually a sub, it's actually a um, it's actually like a side effect or a parasite which is possible in the system, and which at least Christ at the outset recognized as going to happen. It's like this is the world I'm setting up. Know that it part of this is this parasite which is going to play itself out and going yeah. to lead to a kind of death of some kind. I just listened actually to, I can't remember who you spoke to about the idea of the, the Christ antichrist pattern. Um, we are talking about uh, Nero and um, uh, who is the, there was a, a ruler, a ruler of, I think the Greek Pontic states, uh, Mithridates. Oh, this was uh, with Richard Rowland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for anyone who's curious about this and wants to go deeper, I think that's a really, really profound conversation. Um, so, can you tell me, I'm, I'm curious how, I, like, I don't know the scripture well enough to say, okay, yeah, I, I get how how Christ calls out that potential parasite. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? I think, like, for me, the origin of that, this, that call out or the, the origin of the pointing to it is in the story of Judas. Mm-hmm. So think about, so it's also the problem of any system. So it's like, imagine any system, all systems are going to break down, right? So it's like any any story, any system, any hierarchy, any structure has entropy in it, right? It's just necessary. It's going to move towards entropy. So what Christianity seems to be, at least unless someone finds another another example of this, but what Christianity seems to be, seems to, at least in, in my vision, to be the only system that has included in its own story that demise. So, so Jesus chooses Judas in his disciples. He's got his 12. Yeah. He chooses one of those disciples to betray him and to lead to his own death. And so you could say that like, that's something like the weird pattern of antichrist. Like it's actually part of Christianity. So Jesus chooses Judas to betray him. And there are a few stories. There are not a lot of stories with Judas, but there's one story that where he speaks to Judas. And it's the example of a, there's a, a let's say a sinful woman, like a woman that a bad life. It doesn't, it's not clear what that means, but it's like, she's a woman on the margin. Who's not living in accordance to the rules of that society. And, and, and the, the moral codes. So she comes to, to Christ and she has a bottle of perfume, per, precious perfume, and she wants to anoint his feet, right? She wants to worship him. And Judas says, well, we should give this money to the poor, right? And in the text, it even says that Judas didn't really want to give money to the poor. Mm-hmm. He wanted to, to steal that money for himself, right? Then Jesus says, no, like, you know, she... Worshiping the worshiping is higher than giving to the poor. Now, Christ says to give to the poor all the time. Christ says, care for the poor, take care yeah. of the poor. But he's saying, no, this is the proper manner in which it has to happen. Uh, if you and and so you can see it, it's it's amazing because in the story, it's so perfect. Judas, it's it's weaponized compassion. Judas is using the the this notion of compassion for the victim or for the poor or for the marginalized in order to get power for himself. And that's what he's doing. It's like, it's right there. Yeah. It's right there in the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a, um, a folk singer I really like, Dick Gowan, um, who's a socialist, right? Really hardcore uh, leftist. Um, and he wrote a song called uh, Stand Up for Judas. Right? And the chorus of the song is Stand Up for Judas and the cause that Judas served because it was Jesus who betrayed the poor with his words. Sure. Uh, but it's really important because it's, it's so important to understand that it's actually a metaphys. It's like it's a cosmological situation. It's a cosmological thing, which is that if you don't attend to the thing that unites you, then at some point it doesn't even mean anything to attend to the marginalized. Yeah, there's. I, I, you said once in one of your interviews that um, that diversity is is sort of a. It's like a death cult, right? Well, diversity without unity is decomposition. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that struck with me. I just thought a lot about like diversity, equity, inclusion, and like how they're, what is the, what is the antithesis, right? Unity, hierarchy, and, you know, the discrimination, we have to be able to say, this is not that at minimum, you have to be able to say that this is not that. Uh, And I've been playing around with that a lot because I think it's, you know, it, it goes to like Peterson's idea that that ideologies are incomplete archetypal stories, that they represent one half of it. Yeah, we do need to attend to the margin. We do need to make space for diversity. But if everyone 
everyone invests more and more in, of themselves in a counter identity and the attention to the shared identity is lost more and more then then the only the only possible result is the death of the commons right nobody is going to be invested in the american project if all identities are anti-american yeah yeah there's no it's already there right it's mm -hmm. it's it's become you know i don't know where the situation is now but like for a while it was it was actually considered let's say you were part of the crowd if you kneeled when the when they say sang the anthem yeah, it's like the actual normal thing to do was now to oppose your own anthem. Yeah, it's like that is some intense stuff. It's very strange, but that that kind of brings me back to this idea that I, of the return of the king, and I've been thinking a lot about speculative fiction because it's kind of been one of the things that really moved my life. Right, reading Tolkien as a kid changed my life completely. I was a kid who who tested as illiterate after third grade, as if I'd made no progress. I had to mm. be taken out of the school system. And Tolkien ignited my love of, of reading. And mm. Tolkien's huge in the counterculture, which is really interesting because people don't realize how deeply Christian Tolkien is. Not just that. Tolkien's world is like the most traditional like world, like universally traditional world. Oh, it's super traditional. But... But I was, I've been thinking, I've been reading, I, I just finished a, a series of books uh, called um, The Age of Madness. There's a second series of books by uh, by uh, Joe Abercrombie. And Abercrombie, basically, the kind of genesis of his story, the first book is called The First Law, Law Trilogy. And he um, he had this idea, and it, it's, it's I think it's so it's so resonant of the, the problem of sort of postmodernism and the deconstruction and inversion of everything without the replacement of the story with something teaches more because he, he had this idea of what if to, what if Gandalf didn't have a divine mission what if he's just a power broker like everybody else mm -hmm. all of a sudden this this guy who travels around behind the scenes manipulates kingdoms becomes this extremely dark and scary figure mm. and so he centers his his story kind of around that Right. Mm -hmm. So you have this character who does that. And then you have all these tropes of of uh, of fantasy fiction. You have the the chosen one, uh, future king, and you have the the kind of like all conquering warrior. And at each level, he essentially inverts it. And then when you look at the story, the story essentially just completely resets at the end of the first one. Right. The power structures that be are the power of the structures that be. And they're just as corrupt in the beginning as at the end. Mm. Then he does a second trilogy. And so essentially at the end of the second trilogy, that Gandalf character is no longer necessarily in power, but you realize that his replacement is just equally bad. Mm -hmm. And I think he's one of the best writers in the genre currently, like on a sentence to sentence level, like he writes compelling sentences, compelling characters, compelling paragraphs, amazing action scenes. But I realized at the end of it that I'm not interested in reading any more of these stories because what's the point of reading a story where the bad guy beats the bad guy and then they go at it again yeah <laughs> right like I, it's like watching your two least favorite football teams battle it out in the super bowl right? <laughs> whoever wins i lose yeah it's completely cynical and completely and yeah. uh I, i've been really I, I think a lot about another series called the second apocalypse which is really deep in the the kind of philosophical mud but it, essentially it comes out the same way and i have a sense that do you feel pretty, like he's moralizing in the book? Like he's kind of denouncing this or he's just describing it? Uh, I think that he, I think <laughs> it's, I think that all of these stories, what I've realized, they're all basically postmodern, right? They want to play in the Tolkienian world, but when they approach it, they can't, they can't commit to the overarching moral vision and they're scared of that moral vision. So they have to invert it. Yeah. They don't actually have a replacement. The only thing they have is the inversion. Yeah, and they and but they have the illusion, and this is this is usually what happens in the kind of postmodern. You know, when 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 Jordan talks about postmodern neo Marxism, and people yeah. say that doesn't exist, and it's like, yeah, you're right, it doesn't exist, but it exists in the sense that the the person who does that cynical move thinks that they're not part of it. Yeah, I mean, I that do they think are somehow like standing out morally outside and judging it, but it's like. If you portray a world that is completely cynical, completely manipulated, completely that, it means that you are doing the same 
you're you're there too yeah. like don't pretend like you're standing above it and and uh and judging it because you're in there as well it's the problem of of problematizing right of, of you're just problematizing everything <clears throat> uh, I, I do have to say i think that jordan's characteristic a characterization of of postmodern neo-marxist is not so inaccurate i mean i think that you can track like I, i've been very influenced by james Lindsay's sort of tracking yeah. of, of Marcu, you know gramsci marcuse angela davis it's like i think critical race theory is very much influenced by marxism and postmodernism it's deeply in, indebted to both schools yeah and Lindsay is doing us a great favor like Lindsay's doing a doing the the actual genealogy and showing yeah. us like this is why this is where the ideas come from this is how they transform and this is the fruits of of these ideas in the culture yeah i've been, i've been impressed by yeah. by by what he's been able to help people understand yeah so just bookmarking that but going back to the idea of return of the king so i was thinking yeah. to me <clears throat> The more I think about, it, the more I think that Harry Potter is the most profound piece of speculative fiction since Dune, at least. But in, in many ways, it's kind of parallel to Tolkien. And, and I think there's something really interesting about the fact that, um, like, I, I, I think that Harry and Frodo are obviously Christ figures. But there's something fascinating about the fact that Frodo fails, ultimately, in the test of self-sacrifice but it's his previous compassion that saves him from his own sin. Whereas Harry succeeds essentially in everything that Christ succeeds in. He just succeeds in everything, which is why I never liked Harry Potter. <laughs> He's just like, he just, yeah. succeeds, he just succeeds in everything. But that's okay, I get it. Yeah, I still think that he's, she's playing with the archetypes in a really fascinating way that, yeah. that is illustrative and that, that actually does point to the Christian ethic, even though I think it's, I don't know that she understood what she was doing. Supposedly she did. Supposedly she she yeah. said it. She said okay. it that, that it's basically the story of Christ or a Christian okay. story. So, but here here's the interesting thing. I was thinking about this idea that in 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 the Lord of the Rings, you have Frodo stories, but you also have the story of Aragorn. And Aragorn is the story, like you said, it's the return of the king, but it's the it's the renewal of the right relationship of the hierarchy. Yeah. And I think you can actually see that same story playing out in Harry Potter. But it's it's so down tuned, right? Because you have you have the corrupt authority in the Ministry of Magic and Cornelius Fudge and Scrimgore, and then at the end you have you have a new Minister of Magic, and there is this idea that the Ministry is no longer corrupted the way that it was. Mm -hmm. The name is Kingsley Shacklebolt, <laughs> right? I mean, it's in his name what his character is. Yeah, but Aragorn is a deeply realized character. Kingsley Shacklebolt is a side character. The whole idea of of the return of the king, it's present, but it's not. It's 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 so under tuned. And then, in something <clears> like <throat> the Age of Madness or uh, or or the First Law trilogy, or, or a lot of the best fiction that's happening. Even I mean, I think we don't know exactly how Martin's story is going to end. We kind of know, but I I suspect it's ultimately going to end with nihilism. I think they're all stuck in this place of nihilism. Yeah. So yeah, I, and, it's, I just, and like you said, it's it's uh I get it, right? We get it, but uh in the end, that's not what people want to believe. And, and if they do believe that, then they just get depressed and you know they yeah. they don't care anymore. And so it's like if you're gonna care, you're gonna care for something which is good. That's that's actually how it works. Right. It works like that at every level. That's what we we end up caring about things that at least even if they're relative goods and we this we we twist it and we take them to be more than what they are, we are always aiming towards the good. Yeah. And I think a lot of this fiction is based on the idea that that there is no there is no transcendent good and everybody's individual good can just be seen as the other person's evil. And ultimately, like there's there's some there's some value to doubt, right? And there's some like there's a lesson in epistemic humility, but but you can't achieve the good if you can't believe in the good, and so there's yeah, and it, and it lead it's like uh, it's it leads you into it leads so you can see it right because people a good example for me is 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 people who are kind of universalists right and and mm -hmm. they 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 just look at all the religions and they say just basically the same just, just, you know they all have their rituals they all have their this and all their that and. And it's all kind of this, these, these relative goods, right. That are just kind of doing their thing. And they, 
some people might even recognize that they're valuable. They're like, oh, you know, Christianity is one way. Islam is one way. Judaism is one way. Buddhism is one way. And then those people, they don't do anything. Or they don't practice anything. And that's the, that's a kind of nihilism, which comes at having that approach where you, 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 you're cynically trying to escape the story and then looking at all the story and seeing how all the stories are incomplete. And it's like, it's an illusion because you're actually supposed to be inside that pattern. You can't step out of it. If you try to step out of it, you're lying to yourself. It's, it's the, it's really is the Bhagavad Gita again. Like it's the, the whole, the whole situation of saying you, you have to go back. Even after you have your mystical vision, you go back into the fight. You have to go back to combat. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, sorry, I recognize that in the sort of Buddha, right? The Buddha has the, has his, his moment of nirvana. He achieves enlightenment after all these things. And then he, he sacrifices being within enlightenment in order to go back into the world to guide other people. But I, I don't, I, I don't remember that. <laughs> I was a child the last time I heard the Bhagavad Gita. So can you tell me how that's represented in the story of, uh, I think it's Arjuna. Yeah. He doesn't want to fight, right? He doesn't, yeah. he, he sees the, and it's extreme because it's actually a war. It's like he's mm-hmm. a he's a kshatriya. He's a he's a, in the warrior caste. That's yeah. his role, right? You're you're a warrior. Your role is to fight, and so he doesn't want to. He 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 kind of moves away from the battle, and then he encounters uh, Krishna, I guess, and uh, and then Krishna reveals you know his totality to him, like gives him an, an epiphany. Um, but in that encounter, he tells he tells him, "You're a kshatriya." go fight. Yeah. Like that's your role in the world. And it, and it's hard. It's, I always wonder why people like that, like that text, because it's like, it's so, it's so against, it's so against the, I guess the only reason why they can like it is because they don't think that they have to do that. Or they don't think that they have to now say, okay, you're a Canadian, you know, you're a Christian, you're, you're, you live in this world. This is the world that is possible for you. And so it's like, live in that world. Don't, don't try. Don't, why are you looking for some yogi from India? Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you trying to escape, constantly escape this, this, this reality that you, that you, sh- that you should embody, that you should kind of live in? Um, anyway, so that's my, that's my, that's kind of my take on, I mean, I, I say this, I, we're kind of going away from the return of the king idea, but um I kind of get it when people are annoyed with what they're the, the lot that they've been given, but I also see that people who try to step out of it, they don't. Their fruits are are withered, like they don't have w- fruits that are. It's Jacob's story, right? What do you mean? Is it Jacob, or, or I'm confusing him? Who's who's taken up in the belly of the whale? Jonah. Jonah. Jonah's story is the story of like God gives you a lot. Right. And you don't want it. You're like, yeah. I don't want to do this. Yeah. What the Hindus would call your dharma, right? And he and he flees his dharma, and bad things happen as long as he as long as he flees it. And he tries. Yeah. He can't. You yeah. can't really do it. Um, but let's to come to the return of the king. I think that <clears throat> it's something which is somewhat inevitable in the story, uh, but it also there has to be an anti-king first. Right. So it's like th- there's an anti-king that kind of manifests. The Robin Hood story is the, is a really good version of that. And also to help us understand how we're supposed to live in the anti-king time, you know, uh, which is that Robin Hood doesn't try to take power for himself because he knows, right, that he's not the king, that he's not. Mm-hmm. But he also doesn't he doesn't accept to participate in this anti-structure yeah like he he removes himself and becomes an outsider to the structure but he also doesn't try to take power the the story of king david is the same story king david is the is the hidden king Mm -hmm. and everybody knows that he's going to be king one day but he's not and then king saul is trying to kill him and king david even refuses he says i will not lay a finger on this king even though the king is trying to actively kill him I will David, not kill. David refuses to kill Saul. Yes, David refuses to kill Saul, even though Saul is actively hunting him down. Yeah. He has opportunities to do it. And then in those opportunities, he doesn't. And he says, who am I to kill the king? Even though he knows that 
one day he will become king. So that's actually probably a good way to understand who, like how to recognize something like the future king, let's say, and to recognize or to recognize the return of the king. It's not going to be someone who, it's not going to be something that steps up and says, I'm the future. I I got this and I'm going to take it from those that are there and I'm going to, you know, and that usually doesn't, uh, doesn't work. It's not Trump. No, I don't think so. He's more like a, he, I mean, he's interesting. Like he's interesting to know like what, what it is that he was, he was manifesting. Uh, But yeah. I mean, obviously that invites a lot of, a lot of political controversy, but (laughs) You know, I think that a lot of people recognized him as, and still recognize him as an enemy of a corrupt authority structure. And because he's the enemy of their enemy, they view him as their friend. And that's, yeah, but he, he's more like a, he's more like a, I don't know. He's, he, it's hard to tell like what he, what he is. He is a kind of interesting jester figure too. Like he has a kind of jester quality to him. Um, <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a world wrestling that's right he's a he's a wrestling villain that's for sure he was a wrestling villain all through his all through his his presidency he was a wrestling villain and that if it's like those are the kinds of things that can almost kind of make you think and like to kind of make you wonder about giant conspiracies because he was really a wrestling villain he was acting like a wrestling villain he was Mm -hmm. being portrayed as a wrestling villain and it was like and he actually was at some point in his career a wrestling villain so yeah (laughs) Yeah. First we had the actor as king, and then uh, then we got all the way down to the the wrestling uh, the, the wrestling villain. <laughs> villain, the wrestling heel. So I've been thinking about the idea that you know you you put out a lot of media sort of critiquing the the current corruption of our storytelling apparatus, and I, I consume a lot of other media about that because it, it really bothers me. There's something about a culture that that's telling stories in a way that's so um, it's weird because it's both deeply formulaic. And also, um, well, it's extremely ideological. I guess those two things are not, uh, but it's the ideology of rebellion. Yeah, well, it, that, it, that's what I'm telling you is that you you have to understand that you can't completely escape something like the meta pattern, mm-hmm. right? Rebellion is recognizable. Yeah. There are tropes of rebellion. There are tropes of marginality. There are tr- All these things are recognizable and therefore they don't, they serve a function in the, the big, the big thing, but they, they're not really rebellious. <laughs> like they, 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 they're, they're not really rebellious in the way that a lot of people can imagine that they are or can imagine themselves to be. Yeah. They're, they're playing out. They're portraying the rebellious pattern in a way that, that seeks con- ideological conformity. <laughs> yeah. Well, just inevitable. in order to inhabit that rebellious pattern, you have to conform to a, to an ideological and a, even an aesthetic pattern, like you have to actually have a certain aesthetic quality to you in order to, to be the rebel, you know? Yeah. So like the image of the rebel who is fractally a rebel, you know, is something which is real. Like he's a political rebel, but he also doesn't dress like everybody. He also, you know, doesn't conform to smaller <laughs> rules. Like he, he's a, but the, the funny punk thing. rocker is the ultimate yeah. uniform like is the yeah. is the best uniform. He's also sexually transgressive. He uses uh, sadomasochistic imagery. It's like that's the ultimate trans. The ultimate um, like uh, like I said, uh, uniform of the rebel was the punk rock uh, yeah. uniform. It, it's 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 interesting. It's it's fascinating to me that like I was thinking about this recently. If if I see a woman who has bright pink hair, like I can predict her politics. Right. almost always. And I like, I don't feel like that was necessarily always true. I feel like 10 years ago or 20 years ago, that relationship existed, but it wasn't as, um, as canalized as it is now. Mm. Whereas if you see somebody who is dressed in a sort of, I guess, standard square, right. <laughs> That's what I think of myself. I think of myself yeah, as a your standard square. Well, I think of myself as like, I defaulted out of the counterculture and and sort of adopted the square culture, but I'm, yeah, I'm I'm somewhere in the liminal space between the two, yeah. but but nonetheless, like you can't necessarily look at me and say, "I know your politics based on what you look like." Yeah, no, no, I don't think so. And uh, and and so there's something interesting about the the idea of the conformity of rebellion. 
and how that's playing yeah, out. It, it's also it's also because it stands out at the extremes, and so it 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 uh, demarks itself just mm -hmm. inevitably because it, it it's an extreme version of something. So it's it just pops out, right? It just stands out as yeah. And it's in, yeah. So so on one level, I see the mainstream storytelling as deeply just corrupt and and, and so boring, right? Like I. Uh, <laughs> you know foundation is one of the best sort of science fiction series that's ever been i love science fiction so they just come out with a new a new uh new foundation thing and um and they cast jared harris as uh as as harry selden and harris was amazing and, and lots of things so you're, okay cool this is gonna be great so you you start to watch it and um they've they've gender and race switched gal and so you said well it's a, it's a, it's a it's a there's a far future world, right? There's no reason why the people are going to be any color that we currently. Yeah. So that doesn't really matter, except for that it's emblematic of the way that the culture that our stories are being told now. And, and especially if they make it an issue in the yeah. story, then it's another level because it's like, OK, until you made it an issue in the story, I yes. didn't care about this. But now I do care about this. Well, that's the funny thing. So I look, so I have this like, okay, I know that I know that something is going to be ideological once certain things start happening, probably. So you see Gal Tarkin and and it's a brown woman instead of a white man. And you're like, okay, but it actually doesn't matter. To her role in the story has nothing to do, or his role in the story has nothing to do with his race or his gender. So it's like, well, I'll I'll ignore that. But then they introduce Salver Hardin, who's like the first heroic character. And they've also raced and gender switched him, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the thing that's interesting about Harden is he's, he's this super agentic, assertive, masculine leadership rebel, rebel, rebel character. Who's, who's, um, who's key saying is violence is the last resort of the incompetent. And he solves everything without using violence. That's the whole element of his story. And then they change him, but they, and they put a woman in his place and then they make her very violent. <laughs> And she solves everything by violence. And so they take this idea of toxic masculinity, which is being critiqued in the original character of Salver Hardin, and they make it good so long as it's a brown woman who is doing it. Yeah. And so the, the entire meaning of the story has now been inversed, but there's no, there's no new meaning that's actually transformative or powerful. Yeah, and it's and it's this is something that if people want to like I if people want to know, this is something that's gonna happen more and more is that there's going to be if there's going to be a lot of stories where the bad guy is the woman this is going to be really important where the most evil most bad guy person is the woman and like for example in in uh in the falcon and winter soldier series they had this um this uh terrorist uh woman who is cruel like would kill people would do all these things uh, and, and she was like the leader of a terrorist group. Like how many leaders of terrorist groups are women? Like, come on, man, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but okay, whatever. And so it's like, okay, see, here she is. She's like, multi, she's like a kind of multi-ethnic character, you know, that actress with the, with the, the red hair. She's kind of, she, I don't know. It's, it's hard to tell. Uh, and so it's like, okay, this like multi-ethnic character. And then, and then they portray her with like the deepest sympathy that you could imagine. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just like, what like are you serious is this happening on top of the antichrist christ pattern the 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 video of yours the probably the video of yours that i think has made the most impression on me just like really was thinking a lot about it was the montero and wandavision video and uh the idea that that wandavision is the story of the matrix stole told from the perspective of the matrix, of the matrix the pretty much that's what it is <laughs> it's, and and you and you are seeing that right and it's there's something very strange about that so we could dig deeper into that but i wanted to to kind of root back to another point which is you're saying look for the narrative of the turn of the king i don't see it right i'm not seeing it and 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 like you know i, I pointed out harry potter as as the story that kind of like most embodies a lot of the archetypal stuff that say something like tolkien had but but it it it, it's it, not there yet down, it's but down, it's gonna it's it's yeah. going to it has to come there's no way around it like it's but it's because it's even but it's not going to come necessarily from the same sources it's going to come from a surprising place because because obviously the, the these these patterns of storytelling are going to just keep ramping up and keep 
you know, the, the, the one which is becoming so nauseating and like just so obvious is the idea, like the anti, it's, a, it's another interesting antichrist pattern, which is that you have a male character, a, ma- a male character that sacrifices himself. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, it's a perfect story arc, but yeah. he does it in order to be replaced by a female character. And it's like, you could see it. It's been happening for a while now. And it's been small. Like it, you could see, you could see it like little by little coming up. But now it's so egregious and so obvious, you know, that it's just painful to watch it. You just see it. It's like, you watch the story and you're like, okay, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. The green knight story was the ultimate, like, it was so interesting that at the end of, I don't know if you saw the green knight, but at the end oh, of the movie, weird. they they reveal like that pattern. It's like, it's insane. They have like an extra credit scene which they didn't, which they didn't need, but they put it there. It's like a coda, which tells you, this is what it's all about. It's about, it's, a, it, it's about replacing it's the replacement. king. Yeah. yeah. But, but like I said, it's going to, it's going to play itself out. And at some point there'll be no, there'll be no other story to tell. So um, the reciprocal to this idea that the kind of mainstream secular culture has this really broken storytelling is where are the deeply Christian stories that are profound the way that Tolkien was profound? Like I think of like, I could just be wrong about this. Maybe I just don't read, but like to me, the, 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 the emblematic Christian literature of my generation is left behind. <laughs> no, you look, there's no, I have no, this is what we're doing now. Like this is what we're trying to do right now. And so it's like, it's, I think that it's something which is on the horizon, but hasn't completely landed yet. And so there are inklings and there are seeds which are growing, <clears throat> you know, my, <clears throat> like, I don't want to, to say that, that what I'm doing is going to be the thing, but like, well, we have a graphic novel that's starting crowdfunding on October 31st yeah. and it's called God's Dog. I'd say, and it's actually a series of graphic novels, which is yeah. going to use the biblical world as a uh, world building as a mythological substructure for uh for a story um and so the story has a kind of cosmic aspect to it just kind of like in lord of the rings but then it also has personal stakes and and uh and it's basically a story of transformation of a monster into uh like the the, the taming of a monster you could call it mm-hmm. um and so it's like we're gonna try we'll see we'll see we'll see how it goes but there's other people like nicholas kotar who's been on my channel you know, he's publishing fiction, uh, which is kind of fantasy fiction that is not directly Christian, but is kind of like Tolkien, which is embedded in this kind of fairy tale mythological vision that is not upside down. That is a, that is like a proper, let's say, vision of this fairy tale world. And there's going to be, I think, there's just go, they're just starting to appear. And I think what's going to happen too, like for example, if you look at I did an interview with Paul Kings North, right? Uh, and and Paul Kings North, I think some of them, some people are actually going to. There's going to be people that are going to convert to Christianity, like people who just are, are at the end of this thing. They're looking at it and it's like, here's like the woke thing is opening up in front of them, and they they realize that I don't have a lot of options in order to live in the world, and so I think some people are going to. I think we're going to see people convert and then artists even just like there's a lot of musicians that are already doing that a lot of musicians are converting it's like weird oh, yeah, yeah it's like, and it's very interesting because of there's something about patterns i don't know what it is something about patterns that that they get really intuitively uh but anyways that's my prediction but i don't i don't know i mean i, I that's my prediction so what's coming up for me is i'm curious like i uh i actually really like the story of moana and I think that that's a story that has, well, we've been talking about kind of how the replacement of the masculine hero with, with feminine heroes, it's not, it's not, it doesn't make sense the way that it's being done. It, it just, you think in Moana, I didn't think, I thought in Moana, it didn't make sense either. I think Moana was one of the first, like, the yeah, first well, that's, that's what's interesting that. because I, I watched your video on Moana and I, yeah. and I actually think that you're right too. Yeah. Right. Like, I think that the points you make are, are really interesting in that video, but there was something really profound about that story for me. And, and it got to something that is, I think, one of my big hesitations in, say, embracing Christianity, which is that it, um, 
is the relationship with the feminine doesn't seem to be fully fully represented or well balanced in the Christianity Mm -hmm. that I've seen. And even in the idea of the Trinity, the idea of a father, son, and a Holy ghost, it's like, well, to me, (laughs) the ghost sounds like the ghost of the feminine. That's not there. Um, And, and we, and you know, you can, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a, within the kind of historiography of, 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 of Semitic religion, there's this idea Yahweh used to have a consort. There's evidence that that is a thing that that showed up in the, the old temples of the Israelites. It's it's controversial, but it's an interesting idea to me. And you know, when I first encountered Peterson, he had this this idea that you know there's there's the divine masculine, the divine feminine, and they have a they both have a tyrannical and a beneficent aspect. The feminine is nature or chaos, the masculine is culture or, and order. And then there's the individual who, who mediates between them. And that's the hero and the adversary. And then he said, Christianity is the most archetypally complete religion. And I was like, well, okay, but where's the, where's the divine feminine represented there? And, and it seems to me, I had this, this, this sense at the time that we live in a time when it's more important than ever to have a really good articulation of the divine feminine <clears throat> for two reasons, which are sort of weirdly paradoxical. One is that if we think of the feminine as nature and we think of, 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 um, of the masculine as culture, there's never been a time in which culture had so much power over nature and so much potential to damage it. A hundred years, like even 200 years ago, like we were vastly more threatened by nature than nature was threatened by culture in many ways. But now it's like we could we could let off a bunch of nuclear bombs and change nature such that we we couldn't survive in that world. And and so there's something about that that that's important to me. And then the other aspect of it is that due to the pill, due to the change of what work is, due to you know uh, female sanitary uh, sanitary products, due to public bathrooms, women have have been able to step into roles of power in our society in a way that they weren't for the last 10,000 years. And we don't have a good way of articulating how the feminine goes bad. If you mm-hmm. do. Well, we do. We have plenty of ways. Like it's just people yeah. don't know them. Like they, they don't know the stories, but yeah. But in terms of the, the feminine, it's, uh, you know, Christianity has the mother of God if you mm-hmm. if you want to if you want to understand it it's like i think maybe you were exposed to to more uh, kind of evangelical or, or protestant christianity oh, but-, but traditional christianity has the 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 notion that that the that mary is 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 the mother of god in the sense that she is the place she is the throne she is the the container she is the potential out of which the manifestation of 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 god appeared in the world okay um and there is also a deeper aspect to that which is that there's an eschatological reality that is that there's a reality in the totality in the end you could say where all of nature you could say or all of creation is meant to be deified so there isn't a sense in which there's so you you don't have at all the sense in which there's like let's say godfather godmother right like you see, for example, in uh, in, uh, in in many native uh, mythological structures and and things like that, you don't have that. So you have God, and God is usually represented mostly as masculine. Although we we no Christian believes that God is masculine. Like we we, we it's we, we believe that God transcends categories. But in his in his in the way in which he presents himself to us is as father. But that's important because. That's what presentation is. That's exactly. what statement is. Statement, yeah. order, manifestation, categorization, all of these are the masculine things. We can't pretend like we're standing. We always have to stop pretending we're standing outside of this. We're inside. And so when when it's like for for in the Christian world, when the divine manifests himself, it's masculine. It's father. That's the image. And then it's father moving in a loving relationship with, with creation so that in the end, to imagine it like as a, as a story which extends into totality, there's a joining, there's a, there's a sexual union between heaven and earth, which is fully realized. And that is the 
totality in which all things are called into God and are called to become God to participation. So this is something which is really, the let's say, at least in the Orthodox tradition, this is the way that it's perceived and presented, you know, and this is the way that it's seen. And there's, there's even, there are movements in the Orthodox church called sophiology, which are, which are movements to explicitly, let's say, um, formulate the divine feminine, you could call it that way. Mm-hmm. But those have been prescribed by the church. And I, and I think for good reason, because that's the problem with pretending you're not in language is that you can't formulate, you can't formulate it. You can't put it into a formula. If it's supposed to be potential, once you for, once you formulate it, it's it's not no longer what it is. And so but there, there, there are places, there are mysteries, like you read in the church fathers, they talk about the womb of God, right? They talk, they have these, these expressions, but they're never dogmatic. They're never something you have to like say, this is what we this is this is the, the structure, because what are you doing then? <laughs> Yeah. Um, you're perverting the very nature of the thing you're trying to, to formulate. Yeah. I first I have to go I back. I probably to- got you in a in a space that you never think that you never thought existed all of a sudden. I'm like, what is this Christianity Jonathan is talking about? Well, yeah. I mean, the you said no Christian believes that that God is a male. And I don't that's not the the experience. It's not I, the experience that you have. Right. Like the, I, I like. I, I believe you that that's that's not how it's seen by the ch- church fathers, or that's not how it's seen in yeah. like in the nuanced, sophisticated version of orthodoxy, let's see, or, or the orthodox church. But I think that that is precisely what a lot of, of evangelical Christians think. And and there's this uh, this there's a certain dogmaticness and oppressiveness to the the way the hierarchy of male and female is presented. And it's interesting because I would say that, like, I grew up in a, in a feminist subculture and I, I, one of my first breaks with, with the, the sort of, I guess, mainstream liberal worldview was like, no, men and women are different. <laughs> like, you're never, you're never going to erase that. You're never going to achieve this, this equality. I remember I was a, I was a cultural anthropology student and, um, and it was all, everything is socially constructed. Everything is socially constructed, right? And then I took a sociobiology class and they showed all these overlapping curves of male and female behavior. And then they talked about the etiology of them developmentally. And at the time I was coaching gymnastics and I had been just coaching boys. Yeah. Right. So literally like the first time that I ever coached gymnastics, I went in there and I had two ADHD boys in the class and they were literally running up the walls. Like this was before I'd experienced parkour. I didn't realize that running up walls was actually a thing that physically happened. (laughs) Mm-hmm. These little boys are running up the walls. So then I get invited over to coach the girls. I'm a, people like me as a coach and they think, okay, well, we need some, you know, we need more, more girls classes covered than boys. So he mm-hmm. started, he's doing good with the boys. Let's put him with the girls. So I have like six to eight year old boys. Right. And they're just the most unmanageable creatures that you've ever experienced. Yeah. And I go over and coach a girls class and I have all these six to nine year old girls line up and quietly wait for their turn yeah without flicking boogers at each other without pushing each other without wrestling in line yeah without yelling at me and i was like oh my god these angels like what is going on it was just a completely different experience and then at the time my my older brother had a two-year-old and um and so there's a party a bunch of girls a little bunch of little boys all the parents are hippies right they're all you know, perfectly happy to have their sons play with dolls and yeah, yeah. wear dresses. Yeah, like none of that matters. Hmm. And so he gets a bunch of stuffies and a bunch of toy trucks. These two-year-olds just completely segregate. On one side of the room, there's a bunch of girls playing with stuffies. On the other side of the room, there's a bunch of boys playing with trucks. It was like, it was just like, ah, of course, this is so huge. And, and so I've spent a lot of my life trying to be like, you have to just have to, you're not going to create, you're not going to create a reality in which men and women work well together and in which both people are sort of in an optimal, both sexes are optimal in their well-being by trying to erase the differences or trying to pretend they don't exist or trying to demonize one side or aspects of it. I feel like- Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what happens when they try to equalize is that they end up demonizing some aspects of one and the other. Of both. That's what I think is really weird is that masculinity is, is 
masculinity is viewed as pathological when expressed by boys and femininity is viewed as pathological when expressed right. by girls. So now you know what antichrist is. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's what antichrist is. It's not, it's that equality doesn't exist. It leads to reversal. It leads to upside down. So like you said, so the only, if you, in a movie, like you, if yeah. you want to show somebody who's compassionate and, and, and kind, you have to, you'll show a, a man who's, taking on fem- feminine characteristics. And if you, and you want to show masculine characteristics, you'll use a woman. And it's yeah. like, it's <laughs> insane, but it, but it, but it shows you, it's like, it also reveals, that's why I talk about the return of the King, because it ultimately secretly is revealing that yeah. these patterns are real. Even if you show them upside down, you're always calling to their true, their, to their true manifestation. How many times have you heard a woman say, I'm not a girly girl? Yeah. And, and, Too and many like, times oh. in my life that, that you can, <laughs> And I, I, like, I started, like, there's a point at where she was like, well, why wouldn't you want to be like, which, like, as a woman, which you, yeah, you hate women, femininity, basically. Right. And, and, and I've had that conversation a few times. And like, women looking at me like, oh, Jesus. Um, That's so, when you realize that a lot of feminism is actually, is actually, uh, it's actually uh, fetish, fetish, fetishization of masculinity. It's a, yeah. It's a, it's a love of masculinity. The only way that they can see agency and power is when it's expressed in a masculine way. Yeah. So, so but I want to go back to Moana because I think this, yeah. this captures why Moana was valuable to me. And, and I want to, I'm, I'm curious to, to get your, ta- your response. Oh. So when I first encountered Peterson, he's talking about the heroic archetype and the dragon slayer. And then he says that the, the reciprocal for women is the beauty and the beast myth. And so I was telling everyone the dragon slayer story then at the end of my seminars and saying like, this is ultimately what we're doing in movement practice. We're just, we're just going out and and doing this and parkour is 90% male. So it's like, is this, is this a more masculine thing to choose this type of path? Like, is there, what is, how does this interact with femininity? Mm -hmm. But I had female students the whole time and I learned profound things from them. And they were always really, it was really an amazing thing to work with women so I, I had a, a big seminar in three days. It's all beautiful. It's going great. And then I try to tell the beauty, the beast story after the, um, the dragon story. And I just, it just went over like a lead balloon and these women were really not happy about it. A lot of them were, you know, were really proactively feminist and it, it was not, it, it just didn't work. So I went back and I was like laying in my bed and I was up till like 2 AM that night thinking, and I thought about the idea of the story of St. George and the dragon and that there's a, there's a, there's a portrayal of, of a masculine and feminine aspect of the heroic. And that ultimately both George and the princess confront the dragon. She doesn't leave when he engages in the confrontation. She assists him in the confrontation. And ultimately it's actually her girdle wrapping itself around the dragon that resolves the situation. So I had this idea that there's these two, two aspects to the confrontation with chaos. One is that the destruction of the chaotic and the the assertion, the penetration of the lands. But the other is the holding of the space in which yeah. the chaotic becomes, comes into order. Yeah. And, and I thought about that in relationship to like children, children are little chaos things and you don't, you don't go put a lance in them, right? You, you, you hold a space that has enough strength, enough boundary, enough discipline, Yeah. but that is nurturing. And that's how they come into order. Yeah, it's the it's a home, like it's the yeah. symbol of a home. But and I thought it, it's all there. Like you, yeah. if you if you once you understand what you just said, you'll realize. Even now you look back at the stories, you'll see that there's it's all there. But it's it's not it's there often in a way in which also well, let me let me tell you like you know the story of I forget which sword one of Arthur's sword I think it's Excalibur. So mm-hmm. right so so when Arthur receives Excalibur, he receives the sword. And he receives the sheath and the sword. And with that sword, right, he can strike all the enemies or whatever. And then with the sheath, he's protected from all harm. And mm-hmm. the question is, which is more valuable, the sword or the sheath? And that's actually the one of the some of the questions that appear in the romances. Arthur loses the sheath, yeah. you know, but it's like there's a suggestion, which is that the sheath is in some ways secretly more powerful than the sword. Yeah, that's, well, here was the interesting thing that I sat there and I realized. So I realized that there's something like, um, there's like a heroic power of assertion and a heroic power of surrender. And I had this really strange realization as I was laying there, which was that 
when I did the things in my practice that were most heroic, let's say most dangerous, right? Where if I failed, my life was literally on the line. Mm -hmm. I, I had to call on both of these. And it was the assertion that got me to choose to do the thing and to stand in front of the jump. But I never felt safe until I waited for a sense that the jump was already going to happen and that I was surrendering into it. Mm -hmm. The experience of, of doing the jumps when I could die is not an experience of pushing with will. It's an experience of acceptance, of surrender. And so there was this weird place where I, I would, you know, I consider myself a pretty masculine guy and I'm doing a very masculine thing that's 90% male. And yet somehow I'm relying on this deeply feminine power in the most emblematic expression. Mm -hmm. So I went back and I've shared that story over and over again, and, and it really resonates with people. And so I talk about this idea of the feminine aspect of the heroic and the masculine aspect of the heroic. But there's a weird thing, which is the, the version of the story that I understand is that once the dragon is tamed, they take it back to the village and the villagers throw stones and George kills the dragon. Yeah, well, there are different. There are many versions of the story. Yeah, so, yeah I know there's yeah, that is definitely yeah. one version where where he brings he tames a dragon, brings it and then kills it later. Yeah. and my the the kind of the way that I interpreted that was like, it's a gift of the divine feminine that's not seen. It's too threatening. And so when I saw Moana, like what I saw was you have a feminine hero, but she's not, she's not just a masculine hero inverted. She actually is feminine. And ultimately what she does is recognize the power of love to redeem a dragon and bring it into beneficent order. She, she, she flips the polarity of the divine feminine from the monster, the dragon to the, to the, the queen of nature. And she does that through acceptance and love. Yeah. There is like that, that pattern that you're talking about. I think you, you, you hit the nail on an inkling of something which is positive and you see it in the wonder woman story too. Like in the wonder woman story for all the things I criticized about it, right. It, it actually ends with reconciliation, yeah. right. Which is not something that you necessarily see in the, in the more kind of classic heroic study. Usually it ends with victory, right. So you think of the story where, you know, like uh, invasion stories or whatever, it ends with victory, you know? And so, but, but the Wonder Woman story ends with her reconciling, even with the Nazi soldiers. Like she has this, she has an effect on them where they like oh, yeah. cry and regret what they've done and all this stuff. And there's this like moment of reconciliation. I think she even mentions love or something. Um, and so you're right that that's something that's interesting. That's an interesting possibility for, for storytelling. And there is a little bit of that in the, uh, in Moana. And there's definitely a little bit of that in other stories. So yeah, it's not, it's not completely, so that, you, you, you've hit on something which is not completely corrupt, which has <laughs> some, which has some, uh, some hope for it. Let's say. I mean, I think it's, it, I also see your point about how everything that the masculine hero does is given to him, that he only, he only, his only success is in, is in being forgiven. Right. And that ultimately that the, the, the meeting of heaven and earth isn't, isn't represented in that story. But to me, there was something powerful about the, about the recognition in the story of the value of the feminine aspect of the heroic and also the, of getting the relationship between the potential destructiveness of father culture towards mother nature, right? Mm -hmm. right? There's a, there's a reconciliation of the natural world culture in that story which is represented in the journey of that feminine hero. And that's why so ultimately what you would want is a story where you could do that without having to subjugate, humiliate, denigrate the masculine character. It's like, yeah. wouldn't that be awesome if we could have that? Yeah. Absolutely. It's like I, we watch my, my son and I, we watched the black widow movie and it's the same, right? It ends in the same way where there's actually like a reconciliation with like the daughter of the guy. And like, there's like a reconciliation but the whole movie, I remember my son was asking me, like, why is this father figure there? Like, why is he even in the story, this Black Widow story? And, and as he said that, there's a scene where he's, like, fighting the bad guy and completely getting beaten up. And then for the, that scene to end, the feminine character has to come and basically solve the problem for him. And I was like, I didn't even say it. And I was like, I was like that's why he's there. And that's the only reason why he's there. And it's so, it's so annoying. And it's so counterproductive. Like you could have both at the same time and you could tell amazing stories if you did that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that's, uh, that's what we need, 
right? We need those stories that represent those things both powerfully. So we need the return of the king and the queen. How about that? Let's do it that way. Well, that's the cool thing. It's I think it's so funny. Like the critique of Tolkien is so interesting to me because it's like, oh, he doesn't have any strong feminine characters. And I'm like, wait, Gladriel, Eowyn. Like, look at look at where the world that he's he's inhabiting. But also, these characters are they represent like real aspects of feminine heroicness that that show up in history too, right? And and then. The other aspect that I was thinking about in reference to, to this is the idea that, that Tolkien is ultimately a black and white story. And there's, was, there's another part, which is harder for people to get. And I, and I hate to bring it back, but this is the problem of making things explicit. And so mm-hmm. this is the, this is the, like I was going to say is going to annoy a whole lot of people, right? I'm sorry, but even that feminine character, right? which is like the, which is the, let's say the, the heroic feminine character, there's a manner in which it has to remain somewhat hidden for it to play the role it's supposed to play. If you put a shine of light on it too much, you're inevitably going to make it masculine. And that's why it's like, and that's why probably the way it's happening in our culture now is that it's like the, the nature of the womb, the nature of the, of, of, of feminine characteristics is to be the hidden frame this hidden house this hidden healer this this like private sphere that we have Mm -hmm. and so it's like if the private sphere is the private sphere it's the hidden place it's the secret end of the bedroom it's the king who goes who goes away from the meeting and in the evening and then for some reason when he comes back in the morning he's changed his mind and nobody knows why Right. It's that it's that transformation, which don't denigrate it. It's yeah. it's a real and powerful reality of the world, which is the manner in which things happen in secret and transformation happens in dark places. And so it's like if you shine too much light on that, you're going to change its nature. And that's one of the problems of the situation we have now. It's, it's interesting because as I've been thinking a lot about this, I've been like, well, who, where what are the stories that sort of aren't just well told and don't just get into these issues, but actually point out something new, something that moves forward. And the author that I think is doing that best in, in, in fantasy fiction is Daniel Abraham. And he really represents this, but it's very, it's made much more explicit. Right. But I think it works. I'd be very interested to, to see your take on, on his work, but he, I think he writes incredibly powerful, agentic, feminine, female characters that really change the world um but they don't just play out masculine archetypes they do it in the ways that traditionally women in a lot of these societies had to do that yeah they don't get a medal and i it's like i understand everybody wants a medal but the medal is is there's something of the medal which is a masculine uh like a masculine uh, fantasy and even like a masculine vanity it's not even like it's not getting the medal is not, has no value ontologically. It has no value cosmically. It's just like, it's actually a temptation even, even for men, but Mm -hmm. like the idea that the transformations that are operated by the feminine, not just even like female characters, but just the types of transformations which are operated by the feminine. Like, you know, these are extreme you know you know that movie the i mean i don't know if you've seen the movie the big fat greek wedding i use this example all the time right there's a scene there's a scene so this girl wants to marry this guy who's not greek and her father doesn't want it and there and like the father says no you can't marry the, the the guy and the girl is crying and her mother's with her and she's like that is the head of the household you know he whatever he says goes if he puts his foot down that's it and the mother looks at her and she says yes the father is the head of the household but the mother is the neck and wherever the neck turns that's where the head looks and it's like right and so but that's already saying too much like that that scene is already scandalous because you don't if you tell the man i'm the neck it's not gonna work you have to be it in secret. I'm sorry to like, I'm really like ruining all of this, but like you have to be in secret, the agent of transformation for it to be real. But she's telling her daughter, she's the neck, but she would never tell her husband that mm-hmm. if she told her husband, she's the neck, then it would just be a fight. Well, if the neck claims to be the neck, then it becomes the head. Exactly. And so that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the reality of the secret and the reality of these secret patterns that kind of, and it's the same thing with the problem of the divine feminine. And the problem of 
the way it's presented in Christianity is that as soon as you say it, it becomes a lie. As soon as you say it, it becomes denatured. And well, so you don't say it. This, again, I, I find this really interesting ring with with the uh, with the beginning of the Tao because uh, of, with Taoism, right? The way that can be named is not the eternal way. The nameless is the mother of all things. So the divine is represented as feminine first in in the Tao, and then, but it, it's also represented as undefinable. The only thing you can say about it is that it can't be named. Yeah. And that, that's something which I told you is hinted at. Mm-hmm. Like Saint Ephraim the Syrian uses, he says, the divine womb and then says, shut up. <laughs> he says, <laughs> and I'm not going to talk about this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Um, but it's interesting to think about it. Think about how, let's say, kind of new age type spirituality is. Yeah. Like the nameless stuff is all they want to ever talk about. Yeah. That's yeah. all they care about. That's all they talk about. That's all <laughs> they want to put into light. And it's like, that doesn't work. You can't, it doesn't, if it's nameless, it's nameless, like hint at it and shut up. Don't stop talking about it. <laughs> stop trying to destroy the world with it. And that's what happens when people talk about it too much is that that's they're actually true. trying to destroy the world with this non-dual infinite unnameable thing. It's like, you're destroying the world people. I think, um, well, I think it's really funny because I feel like I said in our last conversation, it, it feels like most people who have been moved by Taoism in the West just ignore the passage about how the 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 un the named gives rise to the ten thousand things, right? They get obsessed with the idea that namelessness is first. Yeah. Don't notice that you don't get anywhere until you bring in the name. Um, so that 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 fits with what you're saying. So I feel like we've had a really good dialogue around the um, the first part of the conversation that I wanted to have. <laughs> and we could Sorry, obviously I keep taking you like off in all these directions. I feel bad. I feel like we could we could do, go deeper, but I. I I, I really want to do the other part of the conversation as well, and but I'm conscious of time. Yeah. So I'm I'm not sure if uh, we should try that, or maybe we should schedule a follow up call like real soon, so that we don't just go for a really long time today. Like, how how do you want to do that? Because I think it's um, really important that we dig into that. Like, a lot of people were wanted to know about the face in the clouds. <laughs> I'm oh, the face, face in the clouds. clouds. I have I'm like, let's say. That. I, I would be totally fine. We could, we could go, we could still go for like half an hour. Is that okay? Yeah. We can try. We can try. So let's, let's be more focused. I'll try to to not take you on crazy routes anymore. So we've been talking about patterns, right? Yeah. This is the conversation has really taken as axiomatic that there, that there are these patterns and they're important and that they inform us in some way, but where we got stuck yesterday was where do these, or last time was, where do these patterns come from? And how do they, how do we recognize them in a way that is, that is epistemologically sound or how does it, how does it, um, how does it, how do you integrate the scientific worldview and this symbolic mythological worldview in a way that doesn't break either? Like that's at the fundamental of, I think what I'm hoping to try and solve with this conversation, which is <laughs> extraordinarily hubristic, but, but yeah. there it is. So I, I, maybe I'll start with this. I was thinking about the, the face in the clouds, right? right. So we're talking about what is bottom up looking at the world as this bottom up thing give you versus looking at the world as a top down thing. So what occurs to me is the bottom up gives you something that's very, that's easy to make epistemologically sound. And that this is where I get hung up is like, how do you know, how, how do you buffer yourself against false claims with a pattern based way of looking at things? And, and well, let me, I, I was thinking about the face in the clouds. Last time we talked about this idea of face in the clouds is an expression of a pattern. I view it as, as a bottom-up development. So you first have, let's say, evolutionarily, you start with single-celled organisms. They don't have faces. Faces don't exist in this world. And then you have multi-celled organisms, and still the first multi-celled organisms don't have faces. Then you develop something, like you develop animals that have what they call radial symmetry, like a starfish. A starfish doesn't have a face. It doesn't have a central point that everything... Um, that contains all of sensory organs. And then you have animals that are bilaterally symmetrical. So that's insects, crustaceans, mammals, reptiles. All of these things end up with this, this orientation where they're, they have organs of consumption and organs of perception organized at the front of their body. <clears throat> to a human being, those all look like faces, but they don't actually function as faces. They don't have all the functions that a face has for a human being. So you start with 
it, it's efficient. There's certain value that you get by having your mouth next to your eyes and your nose, right? It helps you direct things to your mouth. So you have these sensory organs. And then at a certain point- I think, I think we don't disagree. I think we just don't agree with what a face is. Okay, but let, let's, let's get, let, me, let, me, let me tell you what a face is to me because this is me telling you what a face is to me. So once you get to a certain point, there, there is social information that's now coded by the way that the face is oriented. This reaches its apex so far in human beings. Chimpanzees have faces that, that code lots of, of information. A wolf has a face that codes lots of information. Wolves pay attention to the smile and the growl and the teeth and all those things. But human beings have eyes that have clear uh, sclera because it allows you to see where someone's face is pointing. And our faces are much more variable than other animals because it gives social information. So it's easy to recognize. There are people who are face blind. They can't tell one person's face from another. And that's very, that's that's a huge problem, actually. Right? It's a bad dysfunction. So for me, a face. That's why faces. That's what I mean when I say this. The face isn't because that person who can who can look at a, a, a part will see the eyes, will see the nose, will see mm -hmm. all the aspects that you know mentioned. They just won't see the face. The face is not the accumulation of these elements. The accumulation. It's something else. It's well. It's, it's a pattern. It's, this is kind of like the transjective, right? It's it there's a, there's an external reality and there's a subjective perceiver, and then there's a real relationship that can exist between them. And my, I guess the way that the evolutionary sort of bottom up way of looking at it is that 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 relationship arises because it affords the perceiver something of value. So a face becomes a thing for a human being because it affords us this ability to essentially have this almost group mind effect. When you're in a group of people, their faces are constantly telling you what's happening for them emotionally. And so you're perceiving that. And that perception is actually highly, highly relevant to survive and to coordination. And so you become really good at perceiving that. And now when you look at um, you look at a, a reptile, you see a face. And it does have encode information that, that's similar, but it doesn't have all the same information. And you can delude yourself into thinking there's things that are there that aren't there. Right? If you think that your snake loves you, you might just be deluding yourself. Um, and, and it's the same thing. When I, when I think about a face in a cloud, I don't think of dogs. Dogs don't see faces in clouds. Right? That they don't, the, okay, keep they going. don't participate yeah. in that pattern at that level. It's because the face has become so relevant because it has so much information that's relevant to us. They start to appear to us in lots of places where they're not in the sense of, of offering the information that your face offers me, right? So a face is kind of like a function that affords communication between two individuals. All right. So there now we're getting somewhere. I, so, uh, so, all right. So the face is a, is a place of of meaning. So that's 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 it. That's what a face is. It's it's a it's a place of recognition and a place of meaning. Mm -hmm. Meaning comes from faces in every way. Like that is okay. How does meaning it, come from faces? That is, I'm speaking to you right now. <laughs> but but I mean, not all forms of meaning are collapsible to a face, right? No, we, but meaning, meaning, meaning making and meaning comes from faces. Like meaning, meaning in the sense of this participatory meaning making. Like we, yeah. we are the beings that make meaning. We are the beings that participate in meaning. We are the beings that, that recognize our own intelligence. We have self, we have a yeah. self-consciousness. And a capacity to recognize each other and the fact that meaning emanates and culminates into us. If it if it emanates and culminates into other things, we don't have access to it. Like we don't, we don't totally know what that what that is. Like this is the point, right? Like this is this is the this is the place. And the face is the place of, of meaning. And so so I from bottom up, like bottom up, there's a reason, right? There's a there's a there's a there's a manner in which this is this is a real experience. This experience of recognizing someone, right? Of seeing fear in their eyes, seeing anger in their eyes, connecting it, and then empathet impact in with empathy, connecting towards that emotion or that reality, right? And memory being related to that. Like I look, watch, I I see my mother. I recognize my mother. And she is connected in a web of experiences and memories that I have in me. And that all of that is real. Yeah. And all of that is real and has very little to do 
in the experience of it to the distance of your nose to your eyes and to symmetry and to all of these things. That what you're telling me is an abstraction. Like to, it's an abstraction of the actual experience of a face. Right? Your experience of a face yeah. precedes your evolutionary description of how it happened. Mm-hmm. Because when you're a baby, you're in your mother's arms and you look at your mom and she does the faces and you imitate her faces. Like mm-hmm. that's the real bottom up face, not this evolutionary thing that you're describing to me as an abstract, uh, an abstract uh, construction of how mechanically this thing happened to be. So like, that's what I mean by like the, the true bottom up thing starts with your experience, not with the, not with the science. Yeah. Science is not the first bottom up thing. It's a, <laughs> it, it is part of it, but it's just not. Yeah, just... Like it doesn't precede your experience of your mom looking at you and making faces at you. Yeah. So now we're, we're digging into the phenomenological frame versus the scientific frame. Mm-hmm. And uh, this, this gets super deep and it's interesting. I, I'm just like, Oh man, this is going to take, there's a lot, a lot. To it's going to take more than half an hour. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I, I, I think I understand where you're coming from. I, I agree that, um, that we experience the world phenomenologically before we experience it scientifically. Right, that that you're you're claiming the priority of the face is experienced over the evolutionary story of the face in the experience of the individual, and I I think that's true. What's what the scientific frame offers me, I think, is a set of insights, right, as to what kind of information I can get from faces, right, and when when to predict that information is is meaningful, right, when when we talk about that idea of like multi-factor, multi-variable. Uh, justification, right? So if I can, if I look at a face and I can also touch the face and I can also hear the face speaking, maybe I can smell the person. Then I know that 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 thing has a reality that is highly um, reliable. But if I see in a face in a cloud and I so, can't, so let's start with the dog first. Let's start with the dog. This is going to be better because you'll understand it more easily, right? So you say you see the face, you see a face in a dog's face, but it's not there. This is. It's not, it's not the right understanding of where a face is, okay? No, I, I would say that it doesn't contain everything that a human face is. It, it, it is a face, um, but the, the, full, the full pattern of what a face means to a human being isn't yet present in a dog. A dog doesn't rely on the face nearly so much as a human does. But so, the fact that humans see faces yeah. in dogs has immense has immense even evolutionary oh, yeah. power, which is that that's one of the reasons why we have pet dogs. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why we have pet animals. And those pet dogs are a, a, a real participative part of society. And recognizing the face of my dog is one of the manners in which I tame my dog and I, I, I bring him into our community, make him participate in my life, and I will get meaning from the face of my dog, and mm-hmm. I'll be able to recognize and, him in his face. Yeah. Well, here's the interesting, so let's, if we dig into that, there's a couple of interesting things about that. One, dogs actually recognize faces more than wolves do, or at least human faces. They have an ability to read human facial expressions and derive relevant behavioral cues from them in a way that a wolf can't because mm-hmm. they've actually co-evolved to read faces with us. Yeah, yeah. But also human beings are not as good. Like, like the face of your dog contains real information. When a dog is smiling, it means it's happy. Right. And, um, you know, dogs, dogs portray lots of things with their faces that are actually really relevant to a human being and help you relate to the dog, but also human beings can over-interpret dog's expressions a lot and miss really important cues. Like, you know, if you study dog behavior and how to train dogs, there's lots of what are called um, stress signals in dogs, looking sideways at you, licking their lips that are blind to a lot of human beings. And if you look at like incidences of dog bites, very often what, if you watch the dog before it bites, there's all this signal that the dog is giving that are maybe highly relevant to another dog that a human being is failing to see. So I understand enough, that. enough, enough to see that the dog is a tame animal that's been tamed for 
tens of thousands of years, right? So, so it's like, I think it's interesting because when you talk about evolution, you talk about it as a theory, as a scientific theory. Mm-hmm. When I try to get into it, I'm talking about the actual effects, right? It's like the only thing that matters in evolution is the effects. The factuality doesn't matter in the end. Like whether or not it's factual doesn't matter in, ter- in terms of evolutionary development. The only thing that matters is what happens. And the effects. And so like whether or not you're reading accurately the signs of the dog this way or that way, and you could show that you're not reading it accurately, it matters. It only matters that the dog, that what happened to the dog happened. That is that the dog is there and is part of our, is part of our community. And it's the same with the face, right? Like what you said about the, what you said about a dog, is this true to of a person? You can misread a person. You can yeah. misread their emotions. You can misread what they're thinking. All these things can happen, but you can, but enough yeah. so that we have human society and that it exists and that it has been part of the fact that we can coexist as humans. So we're, what I'm trying to get at is how do, how do we produce sort of theory and, and ways of looking at the world that are really, that that derive us effective information, right? So when you understand a face the way that I'm thinking about a face, right? You can understand that a a human face communicates on all these levels to you. And then a dog's face communicates on a lot of those levels, but maybe not all of them. And that you have to attune yourself to certain signals from dogs that aren't the same as signals from human beings. Right, and you will if they bite you. Yeah. (laughs) Once they they bite you, you'll, it's like, it'll after 10,000 dogs have bit uh, 10,000 people, you know, 10,000 times, then at some point, then it'll, it'll just happen on its own. It'll find its balance. Like it'll find its own like a uh, balance of what's accurate and what isn't Yeah, like accurate to the need, to the need of the moment, let's say. Yeah. I mean, well, good enough. Um, <laughs> moving on. So, so then, but you could say, okay, you can interpret a dog's face. Can you interpret a, um, you know, a platypus's face and then can you interpret a, a reptile's face? And now, the, 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 the meaning making apparatus of the human mind becomes less and less adaptive to this context that's more and more removed from us evolutionarily. Yeah. And now if we apply the same face technology to looking at a cloud, that's what we're talking about with like overactive agency detection. The, the cloud doesn't really contain any of that information. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't, it's not a flesh and blood thing that evolved to have a communication with you. So why do we see a face in a cloud? We see a face in the cloud because we evolved to see faces. So you don't see any advantages. You don't see that you don't see any advantages to seeing faces in clouds. You don't uh, think that that could that could have an advantage. I think it could have an advantage. I don't think it's the, it contains the same information. I think it has much more. Uh, it's much more likely to generate a false pattern, right? And this is this is the. But is, I, I, you know, I don't know what that means. I, it's like I think that maybe sometimes I think I'm more of an evolutionary person than you. What is false? What is this false thing that you're talking about? Missing a pattern that will not help you survive. Is that what you mean? That's one way to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, for some reason, the the analogy that that strikes me here is i think you could look at a uh, a face in the cloud as an auger like a a omen that's what it would be yeah and it can actually that could actually have functional relevance to you yeah it's functional rental relevance not in leading you to correct information or or but in randomizing your behavior so uh, joe henrik in his book um uh the secret of our success he talks about the the evolution of bird augury in uh in pop one societies so Hunters in hunting tribes will burn bird scapula and look at the cracks and they'll view that as a map of the landscape and where the cracks are, they'll go hunt. And hunters who use this are better hunters than hunters who don't. Because essentially the default answer would be to look for animals where you've seen them before, but where animals have seen you before is where they don't want to be. So they're trying to default out of interacting with you. So by randomizing your behavior, you actually, um, you actually develop a more robust solution. But it's not that the crack actually tells you where the animal is. You'll still be long, wrong most of the time. It just- but You'll be wrong more than if you didn't. You'll be, you'll be right more than if you didn't. Yes, you're right more often than if you don't use the augury. Um, not because it's contains so you, Do you think you should use the augury or not use the augury? Evolution says use the augury. 
but it only works. It doesn't, it, you know, it works for hunting animals. It doesn't work for other feet, uh, other functions. So, so I can imagine a situation where, where certain shapes in clouds are ended up being picked up by people in the same way and end up helping them randomize their behavior in ways that, that stabilize, right? Um, but not necessarily. It wouldn't necessarily have it to happen that way because the, 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 reason why, the reason why you see a sign is because you have a need for a sign. So you, you use, so, so think about it. It's like you auger because you're hunting, right? You don't auger before you go to the bathroom, right? You don't auger before you, whatever, like you auger before, as, as, because you have a need for something which is pointed. And so if you, let's say you have a, you have a, right? Because we see places in the clouds all the time, right? And so imagine now your, your tribe has a problem and then there's this massive problem and nobody knows what to do and nobody knows how to do it. And it's all bubbling up. And then all of a sudden, several people at the same time see the face in the cloud. And then that auger reveals the answer to their problem. You don't think that's possible, um, that it's actually possible, that it will actually do that because it projects it projects their will into a single space. It focuses their attention into a place. And their problem, which is multiple and messy and, and, and bubbly, all of a sudden receives a, a moves into a funnel and the answer comes down. Yeah, no. And I, it works. And I, it's the answer. It's the answer they need to they need to follow in order to, to solve their problem. Yeah, but it could also be not the answer, right? It could also lead them in disaster. And it is different, right? Like like I, I get what you're saying, and I think that I can create a bottom up, you know, so epistemologically sound way of describing that. That you have this group of mind where lots of things are 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 moving around, and then you have the concentration of attention in that mind on a symbol, which helps you know helps uh, helps uh, derive an answer for them. And you know, like I, for some reason, the analogy that pops up is astrology. If you give someone, if you give an astrologist an astrological chart and give them no access to the person, then they will, they will be worse than chance at predi uh, predicting that person's personality. But I think a good astrologer can actually give someone a really profound yeah. reading of their personality if that person is in front of them. Of course. The, the astrology acts as a symbol set that the person is able to essentially uh, utilize to insight generate. Mm -hmm. The insight generation only works in relationship to the actual person. And it's not based on anything real about the relationship between the stars and the person. It just gives them ways of thinking about personalities that, that, that they can use to, to um, catalyze their own inher inherent intuitive sense. Intuitive. Of right. But I think that that's the problem. That's always the problem is like, why why is it that you have to say that it's not real because there's an intelligent actor in the, in the story? This is, I've seen this the same, like I've seen this all the time with people with mediums, for example, when the scientists will show that the medium is wrong because if, if, if they, if they're not standing with the person, then they can't generate their insight. And I'm like, maybe that's how it works, right? You, you have, you have a, like you said, you have a system of, of meaning language system Right. And then you have an intelligent agent and then you have something which is generating the question. I mean, that's how meaning works all the time. Right? That's how meaning works all the time. So you have a meaning system of words and syllables and and of sentences and of, and of definitions. And those those words, they don't capture all reality. I hope everybody knows that they, they capture a slice of reality, but it's enough. And then you have a question. Someone comes and asks you and then as an intelligent agent. This system goes through you and then answers the question of the person. To me, that's how meaning works all the time. So the, the problem with astrology for me is that, is that Western astrology and Ayurvedic astrology and Chinese astrology, all completely different, right? They're all in conflict with each other in some sense. They all fulfill but maybe the they're function. not if you have an intelligent agent. Yes, they but but they they don't contain they don't have a reality except in being a tool that allows somebody inside it to do it. And this is the same thing with the face, right? You have an experience of having a face, and I have an experience of having a face. And the dog to some degree has an experience of having a face, but the cloud doesn't have an experience of having a face. 
So it's not the same type of relationship in seeing the cloud. The, fa the, the face in the cloud is not real in the same sense that your face is real. This is, again, you all, it's always the problem that you somehow think you're able to step out of your experience, that you're somehow able to like step out into a world where there's outside no of experience. My experience. I'm not stepping outside of my experience because I can, I can ask you about your experience of having a face. Right, but you, can, you can't, how can I say this? You can it ask me about no my way. experience of seeing a face in a cloud, and you can ask me about my experience of seeing the face in a in a dog. You also can't ask the dog to you can't ask the dog about his. No, experience I can't. I can't ask the dog, but I can, um, I can make predictive processing around the dog's face many, many times. Right. So if I see a dog smiles, and in fact, like I could. Now with science, I can go in and study the biochemistry of a dog's smile and find that it's ultimately related to the biochemistry of a human smile, that the same neurohormones that show up that are associated with an experience of pleasure are showing up in a dog as are showing up in me. But if I go into a cloud, I can't find its neurochemistry. I mean, it's obviously not the same. It's obviously, it's, you're right. It's, it's not the same as the way that you see the face of a person, but it's related. So it's not the same. Well, it's not exactly the same. Of course, it's not exactly the same, but, but, it, it, but it can, it can be a real experience which will have an effect on the world that yes. cannot be denied, that cannot be just said that it's not, that it's false, like that it's a completely, it's that it's an illusion or whatever. It's like, it's not an illusion if it has the, if it actually has causal, it has a causal possibility. I'm reading a book that I think will help you and I continue to have conversations called uh, yeah. Epistemology. I'm talking about epistemic versus non-epistemic perception, right? So if you, if you put a, a stick underneath moving water, its image is distorted in your mind, it, 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 in your perception. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's no longer a accurate representation of the shape of that stick. And if I move, I can see that the shape is distorted and changed the whole time. If, I, if I'm looking at a cloud and I change my position, then the cloud's face can disappear. Yeah, for sure. It's, it, it, that would be something like a non-epistemic perception. Our perception of faces in clouds is not epistemic in the same way that our perception of faces in you is. I can't 100% confirm this, but I suspect that when you and I get off this call, you will go on having an experience of having a face, even though no, I lo no longer go on uh, having experience of perceiving your face. Right, but the face, again, like the face isn't, I, the face isn't just the mush. It's not because if it was, then there would be there. You couldn't have someone who's not able to perceive faces, just like any, just like any, any unity. It is. It's anything that we see as one. The idea that a face is one thing is not a, is not completely obvious in itself that these, all these elements joined together to become one thing. And that we can recognize it is not something which is that like where does it's not something which is at least in terms of like base material description yeah. is obvious. So, so then so so this kind of like I feel like we're, this I am going to lean on Verveki a little bit here right because romanticism is sort of the idea that the face is just inside of me. But it's not right, and and then we have the opposite, which is that the face is completely a a it's just objects up, right? Atomism, right? Mm. And that doesn't seem to work either. So then you have this idea that, that there's a real relationship that exists. And I don't think that the, the fact that that can be broken, I don't, I don't so there's, there's, a, there's a, there's potential, let's say there are, there are things, there are potentialities, there are a nexus of, 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 of let's say a phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the pattern yeah. and those two come and they join together and there's a, there's a back and forth. There's a play between the two because there's flexibility. That's why there are several faces. They're just not just one face. There are many faces, you know? And so this is, so you can look at that bus that you have behind you and you can say, you know, I, I see, I see the face and it's a bunch of stuff, but it's, it's, it's appropriately placed and I can recognize it and I can say, oh, that's the face of so-and-so. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, it's not the face of so and so. Are you crazy? It's like even now, yeah. I look at you through the screen. And yeah, it's like the, your face is obviously not a bunch of mush because if it was, I couldn't see you in the screen. I see you, right? Uh, and so it's the same. It's it's just keep keep 
playing with that. And at some point you realize that the manner in which faces can manifest themselves to you is, is variable. It's a, it, it's multiple, it's variable. Yeah. And it, and those experiences can be real. Like you, if you look at a picture of your mother, right. And you have a feeling that you can't just say, well, it's a stupid illusion. You're not with your mother. What are you, what are you doing? Like, are you deluding yourself by getting an emotion and looking at a picture of your mother? It's like, no, this is a real experience. Hmm. We're, getting so we're kind of going, we're, getting, we're, kind of, we're hitting the same wall again. I get yeah. it. I understand. Yeah, yeah. I, understand. I, I anticipated this. I think it's, I think it's, I think we're getting further though. I feel better about my articulation of my argument, right? I think you understand it better. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm not saying, look, and, and listen, I, I just want to say one thing about the face in the cloud. It's like, I'm not saying that every time you see a face in a cloud, that it somehow has meaning <laughs> any more than, I don't think that every time you have a dream that you, that has meaning. Like dreams are just a bunch of chaotic stuff, like just a bunch of things that mash against each other. But once in a while, you have a dream that is clear and that is speaking and you wake up and you're like, whoa, there was something there for me to, 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 to get. And I think that once in a while, you'll see something in nature which will come together into a sign and will manifest something that you need to hear, that will manifest something, a question you have, a problem you're dealing with, some kind of, and it doesn't have to be a face in a cloud. It can be all kinds of things, but that these experiences should not be. Is this in a piece of toast? Yeah. It, I mean, it could be. Yeah, it could be. But these things, these things don't, how can I say this? That these things are real and they're in a way as real as when you look at a picture of your mother on a, on a, on a screen or in a picture. I, I think that we're getting hung up on the realness in a way that's maybe not useful because I think that we that you can see it as, as um, it, it's kind of like, it's almost, you might almost say this is a higher expression of, of, of something. It's like, I think about a tree, right? For me, like what is, what is a person's relationship to a tree? So a person who, who doesn't do anything with trees, right? They, they see kind of a wall of green next to them. It's just, it doesn't have a lot of meaning. When I look at a picture of a tree, it doesn't contain all the meaning that the tree does in reality. So then I go into the tree and now I'm moving the tree. And now it, now all this, this potential meaning is now present for me. And I can go from being someone who does parkour in a tree, and now the tree has all this meaning to me, to being somebody who gathers from trees, right? I, maybe I harvest bark for tinder from that tree, or I harvest fruits or nuts from that tree, or I harvest animals that live in that tree. And all of a sudden, like all these layers of meaning become more and more, more real. The tree is in some sense more real for me as someone who does parkour in trees than it is for the next person who doesn't do parkour in trees. It contains more information and is a, is a picture of my mother. But like, why is like, real contain more information? Like, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of, of that. I'm not a big fan of that, of that definition. That's yeah, a pretty so, crazy so definition of real. Well, think about it like this, the idea realize, to realize something, to make it more real, right? As you and I interact with each other, we're actually realizing each other. We're making each other more real. I have an avatar in my head of you from watching your, your, uh, your presentations, right? You have some avatar in your head from me, from our previous conversations, but it's not a complete representation of who we are. And the more we interact, the more that, the more of the other that is revealed to us. And we are in that sense realized that has more to do with connection than information. Cause I could, you could, you could, you could have a, what's the difference. It's like, I could give you a file of like, you know, my entire history and you could have every detail of everything I've ever done in my life. And that wouldn't make me more real to you. Yeah. Right. It, it would in some sense. A, I, I think it would. No, at it's some point you'll, you'll, you'll drown. You'll yeah, drown right. in detail. Yeah. Right. But, it's the sense of like, th this is where that's like the propositional, right? A file about you is just propositional information. It doesn't contain the participatory or. The yeah. So real is more like that. It's more like a, a participant, a participatory connection with something Yeah. where you, where you, how can I say this? Where it synthesizes into your experience and you yeah. have, and that's what that's, that's more real yeah. than information or quantities of information. Well, I, I think it's different types of information right? Like the propositional information isn't, it, it, there's no amount of propositional information that equals participatory information, mm -hmm. but they're both information to me. That's, that's the way that I'm thinking about that term. Hmm. Interesting. 
right? Yeah, I don't see it the same. I don't see it the same way at all. I mean, if you look at the form, if you look at like the, the etymology of it, information, right? In participating with that, something is formed within me. So, so for me, you could use a different word. Um, you know, we, we're getting hung up on the semantics there, but no, but it's a, if, at least for for like a. It's not, I don't think it's semantic because there is a sense, like there is a difference. Let's say in, in a kind of, in a traditional way of seeing, there is a difference between direct experience, mm-hmm. which is unitive, actually. Yeah. It transcends multiplicity. It, it moves into one. It's like, you get it, right? It, it, it smashes into one. And information, which is this multiple details about something that I can accumulate. And so... The, the direct experience, which is usually related to like the mystical experience, right? This mystical experience of God, this mystical experience of someone that is actually, it's different from information. It's identity. Identity and, infor- and, and information is not the same. The reason why a face exists is one thing. And the information about the face are not the same. There are two different, totally different levels of reality. One is the reason why you even think a face exists. And the other is the analysis of its elements. But those two things are not the same. But the experience of the face the is, a, is, a, is, a, is a mystical movement into one. I, I agree that they're not the same. I just have an <laughs> overarching category that contains both. That's you, where I use the, the term information. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but it's a dangerous thing to do because I think that might be one of the reasons why we're clashing so much. Why do you think it's dangerous? I mean, because like when you think about information as something that comes into you and changes the form within you, like you could think of procedural uh, perspective. So, right, you know, Vervik uses the term knowledge, right? Propositional knowledge, perspect- uh, procedural, perspectival, participatory, right? You could also think of those as, as there's information that's contained at each of those levels. There's a way in which engaging with something at any of those levels changes you, right? That you are formed through that relationship, through that mm-hmm. connection. The connection, information moves along that connection. So because okay, let, let's 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 look at that. So that what you're saying, yeah. there's something real about that. But that has not has is not the same as analysis. Right. When I encounter you, like, let's say I look at you, I, 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 I recognize your faith. Yeah. And if I now and now and now if I start to describe or to attend to the elements of your face. Right. Those two things are not they're not the same in relationship to the face. Yeah. They're just not they're, they're not the same. Yeah. One is Absolutely. they're actually using different different types of they're, they're using the difference, I think, between when you describe uh, like natural selection and evolution as this like technical process of how things accumulate and, da, 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 and saying you're a baby and you're looking at your mother. Mm-hmm. Right. Those two things are very different. Uh, uh, so you, you, substitute. <laughs> we might be reaching the end no, of no, our, I, our conversation. I feel like we're reaching the beginning. This is exciting for me. I, obviously, you know, we're not going to be able to finish it here, but this, I think this is where it's getting deep and where it's also, I actually feel like we're, 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 we're moving. It's working. You, you you substituted the word analysis. You use the word analysis, which to me is recognizing the distinction that I'm trying to make. That information can be seen as an overarching category. I'm not saying that you have to use it that way, but if you understand that that's the way that I'm using it, mm-hmm. it will help you. Okay, where I'm coming from, right? So when you so I think of like proposition as something that I can semantically juggle. I can represent it in a word, and I can move the words around in my mind in order to create a logical, coherent system. And that that's useful in a specific way, but it doesn't contain everything. And I think that we we agree on that. Mm-hmm. So so if you so when I think about have you have you have you encountered JJ Gibson at all? I, I think that there might be something really useful in this this conflict between what's called information processing theory and direct perception theory in in actually trying to bridge the gap between this phenomenological versus scientific worldview. I don't understand it well enough, unfortunately, to really build the, the bridge right now. But you've said a lot of things that 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 kind of hit on this idea of almost like direct perception. But um but I think that the, the way that I'm using information, right? Um what's important to me to, is to understand that the face in the clouds is 
it, it doesn't contain all the things that a face in of another person contains. And you have to be able to describe how those are different. Yeah. And, and so to say that it's just that they're, they both participate in a pattern to me, I don't know what that I derive from that. When I think about a face as being this bottom up evolutionary process, now I have predictive understanding of how I interact with the faces of other humans, other animals, non-animals. Like <clears throat> I, I start to, to have a more powerful thing. The other, the other example that, that has come up in this, in this idea of emergence is the idea of water. You can take, you, we were talking about the idea that hydrogen and oxygen don't contain wetness, but that's not actually true, right? Like hydrogen and oxygen can both be cooled down to the point where they're stable as liquids. And just like ethanol or, you know, any variety of things in that liquid state, they participate in many of the qualities that water has. We just don't observe, observe them in our world generally in that state. But once we understand from chemistry or science that that when these two things come together, what's emergent is the this place in which they act as water and act as liquid and how that liquid behaves, right? What's amazing about, about water, one of the things that's amazing about water is that water, that solid water floats on liquid water. And most, most, most elements behave the opposite way. The solid will sink below the liquid, has higher density. When we understand water and we think about, okay, if we understand more about those elements and how they interact, then we can, we can look at some other elements and how they would interact and make predictive patterns about that. Saying that the pattern of wetness is out there and that it just, you know, it comes down from something. I'm not sure what that gives you. Do you understand the, the problem that I'm trying to point out here? I mean, it gives you that you can recognize it across phenomena, very simply. Yeah. Right. So it this, it yeah. gives it that you can know that you can recognize a pattern across phenomena, that it exists above it in a way that manifests in its multiplicity. So you can say, because if it was just emergent, then it's like, why, why would the wetness of one be the same as the wetness of the other? How can you even recognize that? So let me, let me, I want to, let me, um, I just want to get back to the face of the cloud thing. Just okay, to so maybe, the face of the cloud uh, it's just because, okay, so, do, so can you can conceive, for example, the function of a caricature, right? Okay. And so what, it, what, why would we care about something like that? Like, why would we care about something like caricature? Um, because it's a way for us to represent information that's relevant to us. But it's, but it's more than that. Cause it's, it's like, it's, how can I say this? When you, when you represent a caricature, like when you make someone, Mm -hmm. When you draw something and then the character is extremely happy or extremely angry in ways that you've never seen anybody like that ever in your life. But nonetheless, when you see it, you recognize that sign. There's a way in which it pushes meaning into an extreme, right? And then it reveals to you the nature of a pattern, right? So you, 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 you make a cartoon character and you you draw them in a way that you can never see anybody that way but you notice you see that this person is also looks happier than anybody I'll ever meet in my entire life looks angrier looks more this or that and it actually can reveal some aspect of jealousy some aspect of this some aspect of that okay and so it's like that's that's the face in the cloud that you see, right? That face, that the face, it's, I'm not saying it's exactly like a caricature. I'm just, I'm just trying to help you see how the face is that there's meaning and that meaning can be, can reach apexes that are beyond the biological. They can be perceived as us, from us as patterns, which are beyond this biological fleshy thing that's standing in front of us. And they're anchored in that, right? They are, right? But they're not, they're not completely, there are ways in which we can, we can, we can, there are apex versions of it that will make us recognize the more subtle versions of it, that you could say. And so you could imagine that caricatures could be, a, can train you to recognize in faces, even certain emotions that you never, maybe you didn't perceive before. So they're meaning-making, causal meaning-making representations that now come back down into the world. So what I'm what I'm hearing is that if you can take something that if you can take an element of a face and portray it in such a way that it that it's recognizably not like a face, but it's more. <laughs> it it tells you more about the thing that that face would express than the face can in some sense. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it takes the pattern and stretches it towards in a direction in a way that then, then reveals an aspect of reality to you that you, that you might not have noticed before. Yeah. This reminds me of like, of, of Peterson's idea that like fiction is, is sort of the accretion of experience into patterns that are both abstract. They're not, they're not something that people have experienced exactly, but they represent what people experience in a deeper way than any one experience does. And that myth is, is beyond that, right? Is right. The, the accretion beyond that. So, so, so I would, but I would say is that those states, let's say, that are represented by a caricature, in order for you to recognize them, they have to have a form of existence. This is where I think, this is what I was saying, was where you're going, which is to say that like, for us to be able to see a face that's more face-like than a face, <laughs> There has to be there has to be a, a pattern it's in reference to. I, I don't I don't have a case against that actually. <laughs> like I was you know I listened to our previous conversation like three times and then or four times and I <laughs> I uh, I and I was reading ancient epistemology and Plato and the objects of science and I was thinking about this idea of of the patterns or the forms and I was thinking that it, it's kind of like God where you just can't really say it. You can't objectively disprove it because it exists outside of the of the falsification apparatus of science. Yeah. Right. It just doesn't, it's not apprehendable using that tool set. So the case for it can only be made philosophically, right? And I can't say that your patterns don't exist. So my my mind went to this idea of like, well, does the pattern of a face pre-exist? an animal having a face that, 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 that pattern evolves out of, right. Is the pattern just a bottom up, right. Once, once there's a need for it, then we have it, or is it top down as you would say. And that's, that's also the wrong, it's the wrong question to ask. It's, it's a wrong question. If you want to put the patterns into a world of time and space and you like, you want it to be like, does it proceed what in time? Like, no, that doesn't mean anything. Like it, it, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Well, that's, that's, I was also kind of getting into this, this, this thing about, well, like they eternally proceed. If you, if you want that, they eternally proceed in the mind of God <laughs> and they, and, but they, they eternally pre- proceed in the mind of God, not in their distinct form, but in the divine logos and find reality in the particulars. Okay. In, so, in, in indefinite multiplicity, yeah. there's an indefinite multiplicity of, of these yeah. patterns. It's not like all these patterns exist independently somewhere in like, they yeah. just, ex- they exist implicitly in the very pattern of meaning itself. So one way for me to conceptualize this is that you have, uh, once you have a set of constraints, you have a, um, like a character space that can be explored. We have gravity. So therefore there's a certain set of things that are possible and a certain set of things that are not possible. You can't, you can't take an ant's body and scale it up to an elephant's size. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not, it, the constraints are just not there. It right? doesn't work. And, and there are certain patterns that, that do play out repeatedly, right? Like um, eyes have been evolved repeatedly in different ways. Penises have been involved repeatedly. Like an intergressive sexual organ actually evolves multiple times in multiple different lineages. We see uh, sort of four-legged, pursuit predators that are kind of dog-like show up over and over again, evolutionarily in many different lineages or uh, saber-toothed cats, right? There's many, many different like carnivore lineages that evolve a cat-like form with big teeth. Mm-hmm. So you could say that's a pattern. It's a pattern. It's a pattern that exists because of a specific set of constraints. So once the constraints exist, then the pattern can exist. Well, here's where I got to in thinking about this conversation was, um, well, physics doesn't actually have a good description of time. And some of the best physicists think like sort of everything has already happened, mm-hmm. right? It, it, yeah. it, 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 the idea that the idea of, of the pattern only coming into existence f- from the bottom up, it's almost incoherent at the level of the physics, but there's something about it that feels very... It's at least comfortable to me. <laughs> that might be the most the most humble way to say it. But what I so so I don't have a foreclosure argument on the the this platonic idea of of the forms and those preceding everything else. Um, 
But the question I have, yeah, this is this is too much. But the the the, the two things that I'm concerned on are this: how do I detect? How do I know when a pattern is false versus when it's real? And one, once I invest myself in this worldview, how does it integrate with science such that we don't have a a colonization of science by the worldview that prevents science from operating as it needs to? All right. Well, I think we have to stop though because it's yeah. like time. Is, <laughs> but let's yeah. leave that question open and yeah. uh, and uh, and and we could come back at it at some other time. But like you really got me going for what like two and a half hours. <laughs> I think I've never done a podcast this long in my life. So, so really so, not with John and, and Paul. Um, no, never. Usually it's like an hour and a half tops. Like it can never go for this long. So, so I guess you got it. You kept me going for a very long time. Like, yeah, how is yeah. this possible? So, so I appreciate it, but yeah. I mean, we, I guess we didn't get to the, to the bottom of everything, but hopefully, well, hopefully we got to the bottom of a few things or at least not the bottom of, or at least kind of, let's say, um, sh- shook up some things to, to think about if for the future. Yeah. I do you think that it felt very productive to me and I appreciate you staying on. Like I knew that when we were an hour and a half in and I wanted to open the next can of worms, that it was going to take a minimum of all. Yeah. I was like in half an hour, but then it was like an hour. So I, I knew that a half an hour wasn't going to do it. Was he going to cut it? Um, so yeah, I would love to do that to, 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 to take the next step. Um, I kind of want to read those two books <laughs> before I get to that, but, uh, but I think this is really useful and I really appreciate you taking the time and being willing to, to sit with me for. Two no, hours. it's my pleasure. It's like, it's also like a, it's a, it's a test for me too. Like I'm trying to like, to see, cause you, to, to, yeah, to answer the, cause you're bringing me on roads that I never thought of, or you're trying to challenge me in ways I've never thought of. So it's, it's good. It's good awesome. to do it that way. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Good to talk to you, Rafe. Yeah. Hey, you've reached the end of another Evolve Move Play podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, if you want to be involved in the conversation, please consider joining us in our new membership subscription so you can get access to question and answers with our live speakers once a month, question and answers with me once a month, and a dedicated forum to discuss everything going on in the podcast, as well as a general discussion of movement on our general movement forums. If you're interested in that, make sure to check out the link below, get signed up, and join a part of our membership community. If you can't join our membership community right now, it's still always helpful if you can like, share, and subscribe, and even hit that bell and get notifications for upcoming Evolve Move Play podcasts. But adios for now, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.